hey hey uh uh say hey konuşuyorum şu an geliyor mu Yoksel hey uh hey 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 Göksel Göksel say 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 uh uh a a hey 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 konuşuyorum şu an ha tamam şu an konuşuyorum 2'ye de 3'e de hepsine gidiyor okey mi tamamdır
Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, could I please kindly ask you to take your seats? We are ready for the next session. Supporting economic continuity, investment, export, globalization, and opportunities will be our subject in the next session. Our moderator will be Honorable Dimitri Nataluka, Chairman of the Economic Affairs Parliamentary Committee and Member of Parliament of Ukraine. Just, if you could kindly please take your seats. I want to also start by calling our speakers that are coming up next. President of Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry Ukraine, Mr. Gennady Chiziko, again on stage, if we could kindly call him. And Honorable Member of Parliament of Estonia, former Minister of Entrepreneurship, Andres Sut, please. Member of Parliament of Estonia, former of Minister of Entrepreneurship and Information Technology, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications from Estonia. Mr. Zaiga Leipina, Deputy Sec State Secretary of the Ministry of Economics of the Republic of Latvia, please. And from Bosnia, Herzegovina, Head of Economic Affairs Committee, Member of Parliament, Maria Pendes. We are about to start, so can I kindly ask, please, to take your seats. In our next panel, we will be trying to go over the subjects, understanding the need for coordinated regional and international reorganization of supply chains and investment priorities as a result of the war in Ukraine. This special panel session will provide the audience with deep insights into complex issues from the perspective of governmental and industry leaders. The need for economic continuity in Ukraine and neighboring countries, how they are working with their local constituents to sell their goods on the international mar market, all the while navigating complex compliance, logistics challenges, and other pandemic-related constraints, and how they are dealing with overcoming local economic infrastructure and related issues and constraints. So I want to slowly hand over the microphone to Honorable Dimitri Nataluka, Chairman of the Economic Affairs Parliamentary Committee, Member of Parliament of Ukraine. Hello. Oh, Welcome. You. And this is the next microphone for our speakers. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of the panel, Thank you very much, and uh, thank, thank you for, for being here. My name is Dimitri Nataluka. I'm the chairman of the Economic Committee uh, of the Parliament of Ukraine. I'm the guy who is unlucky to be in charge of the economy uh, of Ukraine in the Parliament during the war. So uh, I'm here to try to make it a bit better uh, for, for my country, for my people, for my nation, and I hope that uh, we can join our forces in doing so. So before the war started, Ukraine had at least 16 seaports, uh, 16 seaports, 13 airports, 20, uh, uh, 20 airports, I beg your pardon, and 19,700 kilometers of railways. Now, today, as you might know, all the seaports are blocked and the uh, airports don't work. Nothing flies there, unfortunately, and the railroad infrastructure has, come, uh, has become a covid target for Russians, and uh, the river transportation simply cannot cope with the amount of um, the, the goods that are flowing and trying to leave the country um, to the other jurisdictions. So we see that the supply chains are collapsing once, a bit, once again, and um, this time not because of the COVID or for some objective reasons, but as you might well know, because of the war. And um, the idea is to um, unlock 
right, unchain the supply chains in Ukraine because as we have seen, this has um, a straight effect um, on, on, on the rest of the world. Now, we have, si we have heard that there have been some discussions regarding the developing countries, but let me get this right, it's not only about the developing countries that we're talking about. And if you are a guy from Germany who loves beer, uh, you might find out that your beer has increased in its price because the beer, the German beer, has been malted also brewed from Ukrainian malt. If, if you're a UK citizen and you love your fish and chips, you might have noticed that your fish and chips got more expensive because the fish and chips have been fried in Ukrainian sunflower oil. If you're a guy from Italy and uh, you love your Parma ham or the, the Italian Parmalat milk, you might have also noticed that the, the price has increased because Italian cows have been fed Ukrainian corn and for that reason, the price for both the ham and the milk went up. And I'm not talking about the Salvatore Ferragano cosmetics and other s uh, European luxury brands that have been using Ukrainian spirit that is al also stuck in Ukraine. And for that reason, the price has gone up. So as we see today, the crisis that we are facing, this war that Russia has unleashed on the territory of Ukraine, um, is hurting not just the developing world, but the very well-developed world. And um, my objective here today is to try to discuss with our honorable panelists uh, an opportunity and a possibility of how to um, make that disappear and go away. And the first speaker I would like to introduce and to um, ask his opinion is Mr. Gennady Chizhikko. He's the president of the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which brings more than 8,000 businesses in Ukraine, a brilliant uh, leader, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, and a very intelligent person um, who has his, his very powerful views on, on the current situation. So. Mr. Chizhikov, I know that only one out of the five businesses uh, were able to maintain the pre-war performance in Ukraine. The situation with wages and hiring is similar, so maybe you could give us an outlook. I think everybody might be interested to hear your personal assessment of business activity in Ukraine at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dmitro, for such a presentation. After these words, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much. I go out, that's all. <laughs> thank you. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, I like it what to be sitting in this hall in a uh, uh, very uh, hospitable, uh, hospital, uh, hospitable country like uh, Turkey, where we can speak very slowly, very uh, in peaceful manner about the business, about the money, about the future. And uh, I would like to share with you some of my personal idea, my personal feelings, because war is emotion. First of all, after there's a logic. Some people don't have the logic, but we know who's. But uh, okay, but what about the em emotion? For us, it's a little bit more than four months, less than five, five months of war. But if somebody asks me how many years your war in your mind, this four months, every five months, this is uh, remind me 12, minimum 12 li uh, years of my life. So many changes happened during this period of time. For example, uh, European Union. What means European Union for us? If you see the map of Ukraine, you understand that Ukraine is a big country, a little bit bigger than France. Uh, more than 40 million people it was, it will be. Okay, and uh, if you see the, our uh, strategy, strategy last 100 years after 1917, when Uc Ukraine was a part of the European Union, or Europe, sorry, it was the Europe. And I still remember my grandmother uh, said about my country, uh, everybody knows in Ukraine what Ukraine is the bread basket of the Europe. Ukraine was oriented absolutely. And after 1917, yes, we uh, relocate our business to the interest of the Soviet Union from the west to the east. And what's now, we, uh, it's, uh, what is this war demonstrated? We come back to the, our roots. We come back to the, our real, um, 
uh, how to say, nature. We would like to continue to be in the part of the normal civilization when the truth is a law. No lie is a law. This is you understand what it means. Because if, uh, somebody asked me, what is it, uh, Ukraine, uh, sorry, uh, Soviet Union, what is Russia? It's always lies. This is, for me, I don't like to live in such a situation, etc. But, shortly, during these four months with Europe, we uh, demonstrated how it's possible to, to change their life from one situation to another. Uh, we go from the peaceful country to go to the uh, understanding that what's war can, uh, can continue, nobody knows. One month, three months, three years, two years, nobody knows. This is a very co complicated co question. But we understand in Ukraine what's our future, it's economy. Because if you, uh, despite the situation we war, we needed to supply, uh, s uh, support Ukrainian uh, economy, etc. And where our b future? The three, uh, as I mentioned, two thirds of our border now is closed. Belarus, Russia, Black Sea, Azov Sea. Absolutely blocked. We have only one window of the freedom for trade, for investment, for every, only the West border. What means? Okay, tomorrow uh, everything will be okay. They blockade. Do you understand what's uh, here is a business? Business never forget. Trust is very important. If he one time happened, or he will continue to think what it happened again, maybe again and again. That's why our strategy, West. We, because for us, it associate with normal rules, normal economical uh, 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 possibilities, etc. That's why I would like to attention, your attention, Ukrainian business understood. Our direction to the West is our the future. That's why I in, in, uh, attracted attention of the businesses who are sitting here. This is for a long period of time, for, for many years. That's why we need to pay attention how to support, how to find the possibility to win-win. I like a president of Chamber of Commerce, I contacted with all of the Europe countries. And despite this, we always uh, had a very good relations with all countries, but uh, most uh, in the volume, first of all, um, Germany, Italy, etc. But now the situation is also changed. For us, became more more attractive country for the win-win uh, working. Ca our neighbors started from Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Hungary, in uh, Baltic countries. This why because we can uh, Ukrainian is very much export-oriented country. We ha we have uh, we produce too much for one country. We. Just one example, this is also emotion. In our stocks, more than 2.5 million uh, tons of the sunflower oil. For Ukraine, we need it for ourselves, maximum 6,000, 600,000, 800,000. We have three, four times more than in, uh, for needed for us. Every second, like Dmitry said, every second battle in the world of sunflower oil, Ukrainian. Second. And what's to do? How to do this? We, you, and now our Ukrainian business looking for opportunity how to adopt this Western border to the new supplies. I was very surprised what many big companies who now uh, before invested, Ukrainian international company in the ports, now started to organize the uh, rail, uh, rails, uh, how to say, hubs on the our border. We understood what. Uh, needed to find some new possibilities, to find some sub possible supply by car, by train, by any any possibilities. This is a new, uh, as I can say, new perspective for may, uh, for next 10, uh, 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years, and maybe for more. This is not just one day, and tomorrow will be everything different, but if, uh, because the situation with our neighbor is not possible to change to one day, you understand. Uh, okay, this is very important. Come back to the uh, business. War is stress, of course, no. uh, and business uh, in the first uh, weeks stopped, and the many uh, businesses uh, can to work in the still now. According to different uh, different statistics, nearby 30 percent, 30 percent of Ukrainian business stopped. You can imagine if you're in your country, 30 percent, 30 percent stopped one day. What is it? 
but slowly we see this percentage became less, 25 according to the information of National Bank. And more Ukrainian business come back to the, first of all, smaller and business, medium sized business come back to the normal life. They would like to produce something, they are looking for some possibilities, and what? Again, we are looking partners. We are looking for some possibilities in our neighbor's country, in Europe, in Turkey, everywhere. This is a huge opportunities for, uh, not only for Ukraine, but for our partners. Please think about this, we, and uh, don't uh, make a decision after uh, when the war finish. Everybody would like to do like this. When you, uh, but, but now it's a very good opportunity. And I very much appreciate it what during a uh, uh, couple of last months we visit, uh, our uh, country visited not only uh, honorable presidents, prime ministers, ministers, but more interesting for, for us, for business. Started to big business coming. And for me, was, for example, important was uh, John Denton, the General Secretary of ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, visited, and some another business association is it's demonstrated. Now it's time to think about the reconstruction now, the, the support Ukraine now, and to find your possibilities in the future. Needed, as if somebody asked me what's needed to do, contact with regions. Region 25 regions, it's differently. Of course, in some regions, real war, but in uh, many regions are very attractive for investment, etc. Uh, uh, finalizing, I would like to say the, uh, to the RX, Ukrainian business after the stress now started to adopt. We understand the so economical front, front became very important for Ukraine, for Ukrainian business, but we can be winner, of course, in this war. But together with you, it will be more easy. And for us, very important, to share our uh, feeling of positive emotion with you. You can say, me or our company take, uh, pay a, 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 some attention, pay some tribute to the future of victory of Ukraine. Now, not after. After it will be not interesting. Of course, interesting, but not so like before. Do you understand? Always more important, first love. Second love, of course, important. First love is always better. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, sorry, this is a little bit uh, uh, out of the business, but who knows? Who knows? That's why I, like the President of the Chamber of Commerce I, and the uh, President of Ukraine Business, I would like to say in Ukraine we have very strong system of uh, business associations. We create a coalition of business associations in Ukraine. We have very important, there are a lot of businesses here. Don't uh, lose the time uh, during the coffee break. Contact and contact, contact. Uh, asking how it's uh, everything. Before uh, we, uh, I would like to say uh, one more. Today, in uh, event for me, it's very important because I see in this uh, hall practically ninety percent of the business. For me, to speak with business always easy. I can say something, but he understand me better when I need it, like po uh, politicians say too much and nobody understand you. <laughs> so sorry, I'm <laughs> very, today is maybe day of my jokes. Sorry, thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. Okay, go, let's go forward. Thank you, Gennady. <laughs> thank you, it was very insightful, I must say. 30% um, of the businesses you mentioned um, are out of market in Ukraine. Uh, we have another estimate at least 50% of the GDP uh, might be lost by the end of the year. But I agree totally with my colleague, uh, Hinadi Chizhiko, that when, where somebody sees tragedy, and it is a tragedy in terms of the human lives, of course, there is also an opportunity. Because imagine that there is a country of 40 million people with 50% of the market that is ready to be started from scratch, literally. Uh, for instance, we had a delegation from one of the partner countries recently in Ukraine to the city of Bucha. You might have heard about it. And uh, we have organized a meeting with the mayor of Bucha. And um, it was a delegation with a lot of businessmen inside. And the question was, how can we help you today? And the answer was very simple. We need glass. Because as it turned out, before the active phase of war started uh, in February uh, 24th, 
Ukraine has been importing the major part of its glass from Russia. Now, do you imagine what amounts of glass are we talking about? Because every time a missile hits a place in Ukraine, the windows are blowing off, and that means glass is being destroyed. So as of today, the Ukrainian glass producers cannot cope with even 15% of the demand of glass that is required in the country. And that is simply one example of the business opportunities that are in Ukraine even today, and they are there. Um, and if you think that nobody dares to start business even at these days when the war is not over, you might be mistaken. An, an Irish company, uh, which is called the Kingspan, has announced that it will be investing 20 hundred millions of euro by the end of August to establish a construction hub in the west of Ukraine. Confirmation. Yeah. <laughs> um, an Italian company is considering uh, investing in the Ujgorod region, which is also in the western Ukraine, in building housing for internally displaced people and for people from academia, for university professors and students uh, on a territory that is at least two hectares large. So these companies understand this momentum that has to be filled and they are actively entering uh, the Ukrainian market even given the risk that is there, but they outweigh um, the, uh, the, the profit opportunities with the risk that is present. Now, um, as we have heard today also from Mr. Chizhikov, there is this, um, in a way, dependency uh, which nobody realized uh, on, on the uh, agro sector. And um, if I might say there are two types of dependencies, uh, a peaceful one, like the one that we have been talking today, the food security, we didn't call for that. I mean, we were just trading and trading, trying to establish as much good partnerships as possible, and there is this hostile dependency, which has been uh, installed in a way to then manipulate this kind of dependency um, uh, in, in the foreign policy. And this is what Russia does. It, it weaponizes everything it can, starting from trade, ending with diplomats, uh, mass media, and so on and so forth. And um, we already see the outcome and the aftermath of uh, this manipulations and this blackmail, I'm talking about the natural gas blackmail, for instance. And uh, there are countries in Europe that are already paying a very high price for that, for their firm and steady position, uh, the position of the true uh, values for freedom, for, for, for independence, and for defending what is right. And um, Estonia is one of those countries. Um, if my cal calculations are correct, the inflation today is at least 22%. Um, and first of all, because of Russia's energy blackmail. And uh, to be honest, you are coping with that very decently. Um, nevertheless, Ukraine also uh, supplied the Estonian market with uh, metal, furniture, much more. And um, if we need to diversify our delivery routes, then you, on the contrary, uh, you need a counter cover, a temporary shortage uh, in the market to look for a, pr a, re um, a replacement from the Russian goods. So can you tell us more about how Estonia copes with the shocks and uh, what can we learn from you? Because obviously there is a lot. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, Mr. Andres Sut, uh, my colleague from the Estonian parliament and a brilliant leader. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dmitry. And, uh, very happy to be here in, in the conference. I think it is an opportune moment. It's a very central topic for the entire democratic world. And for me, there is one simple message for everybody here. Ukraine belongs to Europe. We will stand by Ukraine. We support you until you win the war, period. Now, uh, I think it was very right what you said about uh, Russia weaponizing everything. I think we need to be also crystal clear about the causes of inflation. It's not really that there is a lack of uh, grain or there is a lack of gas or there is a lack of uh, any, uh, any other uh, energy carrier. It is just uh, insane, inhumane war what Russia is waging uh, in Ukraine and the suffering is spread across the world. So that I think is the reality we are facing. 
I pay a tribute to the Ukrainian people who are really brave, courageous, and uh, also my colleagues from, from the parliament, the uh, Rada here in, uh, in this room, really, really deep applause because you are the best ambassadors of, of your country. You do a lot. Um, now you asked uh, how we cope. Uh, yes, inflation is a number one concern uh, in Estonia. Uh, it is primarily driven indeed by the energy prices. There are some other elements as well. Uh, and I very much agree what uh, I think Alina said, citing to Winston Churchill, that with all difficulty, there is always a major opportunity. And if I look back on our journey in Estonia from the early 90s to the present day, so that hasn't never been a smooth road. It has been, I can't compare it to the war, so that's, uh, it's a different uh, situation, but it has been uh, full of challenges. So what helped us a lot was real determination to turn to the West to, or to regain our position back in the West. And that uh, helped to create a business climate, which is very conducive for investment, precisely what you need in Ukraine now. And uh, we have had uh, a number of meetings uh, with our business community in Estonia. There have been a number of delegations also to Ukraine and there will be more. I will also come myself uh, as, as soon as we, we can get the date, uh, date fixed. Confirmation. Uh, so, um, uh, and it is indeed opportunity for, uh, for both sides because you will have a massive need for investment. And I think you will enormously benefit from the fact that you can use the most advanced technologies uh, in in every field uh, I think you will also pass forward to the renewable uh, energy because uh, this is sort of where the future is uh, again the roads uh, the infrastructure what you mentioned I think we need to be clear that uh, in order to be connected strategically uh, we in Estonia are also going to to replace uh, the railroad with uh, with the European one so I think that is also what uh, what you need to do in order to really get rid of uh, of the dependency uh, dependency from um, uh, from Russia, and of course uh, for any businesses, I mean FDI for us foreign direct investment in Estonia has been I think one of the key factors behind the success. We had the Nordic companies coming to Estonia, importing or. We imported, they exported the business culture. I think this is what uh, we are very happy to do also for Ukraine. So bring these values, these traditions, uh, the business culture, which is transparent, uh, which attracts investment. And, and then I think, I mean, you are a country of 40 million people uh, with very good natural resources. You mentioned um, uh, we, we, are, we are collaborating with uh, Zetomer region which is very rich of the forest. Uh, so there is a shortage of timber in Estonia, which used to be imported from uh, Belarusia and, and Russia. So Ukraine is our friend, our good trading partner. So we can make a switch there. And this is just one example. I think there are plenty of them. Ukraine, for everybody in the audience, Estonia is a digital nation. Ukraine is really doing well. Uh, on the digital uh, uh, services what the government is uh, providing the, the the d app what you have is actually more advanced than we have in estonia so there is plenty of uh, opportunities what uh, what this sort of also the digitalization of the world uh, will offer and, and that's why for us uh, i think like uh, lisa mentioned it's really a question about the values i mean th here you can't sit on a fence you are either with the right side uh, democracy and the future, or you are picking the wrong side. And that is a long-term legacy. Also, I think I very much agree with what Gennady said. Uh, investment in Ukraine is a long-term benefit. Once you build these business relations, you, you set it up, uh, I think there will be a major opportunity because Ukraine is going to be fast-growing, recovering country once you have won the war. And of course, the reconstruction needs to start already earlier. So we are, with all our energy, uh, financial means, and just a bit also uh, into perspective, we have uh, given Ukraine aid, military and humanitarian 
which is close to 1% of our GDP. Uh, we have received uh, more than 46,000 war refugees from Ukraine, which is 3.5% of our population. So we have been really welcoming uh, Ukrainians and we are really uh, helping, uh, helping you to, uh, to get this fight to a successful uh, end. And then we all in a democratic world will have a safer place to live, have a brighter future. I hoped the war generation was a thing of uh, last century. Regrettably, it's not. So let's work together to, uh, to build, rebuild Ukraine, to really stand by our words, help uh, where we can and we need. And in most importantly, we all in the democratic world must stand united for the Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much, dear Andres, and I'm really, really uh, honored and happy to say that indeed Estonia and Latvia, by the way, uh, um, the two countries that committed the highest aid to Ukraine by the GDP share, um, and this is absolutely incredible, giving the, the economic possibilities and the potential that the various European countries have. You guys are the leaders, and uh, you are the example for us. And if war has definitely shown who the enemy is. Uh, another thing that the war has shown is definitely who the friends are, and this is as much important as, as that. And um, thank you very much for such an insightful intervention. I think that uh, what we learned uh, from you is how digitalization is indeed helping uh, a country to be resilient to be flexible in terms of turmoil. And for us, I think it's uh, a, le a lesson that we have learned in a hard way um, and we're still learning from it. Um, and uh, another lesson is how um, the state um, reinvents its own role uh, during the crises. And uh, we have seen it all in, uh, in the times of COVID. I think every country more or less uh, has realized that the state should rethink uh, itself and its role in, in I intervening I in the country's economy. But the war has provided uh, a new example of how active should be the state and how efficient uh, one should be. And um, with this in mind, I would like to address um, our Latvian colleague, Zeiga Lepnina. Uh, did I say it correct? Yes. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I know that Ukrainian companies, they have strategic partners in Latvia, uh, I'm talking about the DLRR, for instance, and uh, including the railway transportation and the repair uh, industry. And um, uh, they started experiencing financial difficulties at the start of the war uh, uh, in Ukraine. However, uh, given the strategic importance, uh, including for post-war reconstruction, of course, uh, our government made an exception for one of them. Uh, in the context of the de debt repayment. And um, how do you assess in the general possibility of the cooperation of the government with private companies, the support in terms of the shocks and crises, and uh, um, what kind of the cooperation future of Ukrainian and the European countries do you see in the issue of post-war reconstruction in Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, there is uh, organization forum that I think that's uh, really very timely to talk on, on, on this uh, topic which uh, bothers everybody nowadays. And, and I think it's extremely important that we come together, we discuss, we look for solutions which are currently so important that how to restore uh, regional uh, uh, global value chains, how to think what can be done in food and energy security and uh, of course foreign investments and I'm sure we will we will come out from uh, this crisis uh, Ukraine will all the support will win the war it's uh, important for f uh, all European democracy to have uh, uh, soon uh, this uh, conflict stopped and uh, to start really massive uh, reconstruction but yes like you said uh, even with the continuing uh, war there is continuing uh, support there is continuing as well investments but still of course it's extremely important uh, uh, 
to stop this uh, feeling of innocent Ukrainian people and uh, uh, to start uh, the uh, a real what can be done to help. And uh, yes, uh, I would like to look at the perspective in short term. In the short term perspective, we see that uh, all member states are supporting U European Union member states, including Ukraine, as well as from European uh, funds. Uh, it's each month more than 5 billion euros is needed and uh, it's I think it should continue. It's important is that we keep Ukrainian uh, government, Ukrainian people functioning because, of course, nowadays it's very limited uh, income from Ukrainian companies to government, uh, and uh, that should be continued. There is other issue, I think, which is extremely important. It is EU granted the uh, uh, most generous trade uh, regime for Ukraine, which was never been in European history, that free close, no limits, uh, no even or the minimum requirements or very, very minimal technical requirements. And I think as well that should continue, but still we should look at the new perspectives at new things, how we do things uh, uh, on one hand, of course, Ukraine's uh, economic needs. On the other hand, it is uh, all other European member states and their sensitivity to agriculture sector. But I think common projects are common uh, working together would be the uh, a great solution. Like I said, yes, we are in Latvia supporting uh, very much Ukraine. Our official, let's say, government support is more than uh, uh, 220 million, but I don't, can't count how many private persons are supporting and uh, giving the support and for us as well it's close to one percent of GDP and uh, still we want to help and we will continue to help. And uh, second I think it's extremely important that we work on supply chains, how uh, we look for the new waves, uh, Uh, priorities, I think, nowadays, and I very much appreciate this Turkish and uh, UN uh, involvement in this grain conflict, but still I think it should be done more that we find uh, the solution uh, on, uh, on uh, logistics. Um, and certainly working with international organizations, it's important to pressure uh, Russia uh, to stop this uh, in human uh, war and force sanctions to uh, limit uh, Russia's income uh, for uh, kind of possibilities of war. But on long term, on long term, certainly, like it was mentioned, Ukraine's candidacy status to Europe, Ukraine belongs to Europe, and we should do as fast as possible Ukraine's uh, integration to European Union, uh, internal market, uh, to business environment. There is a lot of requirements, but I think we can do together. Even before war, we had a lot of projects together with our institutions. We as well did this Aki Community Chair. We did it fast, but Ukraine needs to do it three times at least faster than we did. And I think uh, <laughs> it will be possible we have this experience, we have good contact and I am sure we will do. And, uh, and of course, uh, today's theme, and which is no topic number one, is uh, reconstruction, reconstruction, reconstruction of Ukraine, help to Ukraine, investments in Ukraine. And now, now that our companies are already having uh, contacts and projects and planning to, to do it, and uh, I think it should be continued and um, all the best and I really encourage everybody to do it uh, as uh, fast as possible that we all together help and work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I um, totally agree, but I would like to uh, draw your attention on the um, uh, aspect that rebuilding Ukraine um, is much more than a, a thing of a solidarity in terms of principles and shared values. What I'm trying to, to say is that um, we want your skin in the game uh, in Ukraine as much as for us foreign capital and foreign direct investments would mean our personal security. Um, I think that if that would have happened throughout the last uh, decade, the situation even in Crimea would be dramatically different.
For, that, for this reason, we are trying to advocate something that we uh, joke uh, about and we call the, the, the Strasbourg plan or the Brussels plan because of the um, European institutions or the Council of Europe in Strasbourg and Turkey is a member of the Council of Europe as much as Azerbaijan is and other countries. The idea is not to merely have a Marshall plan when you ask the countries to put the money on the table and uh, then trust in, in the reconstruction. Uh, and the happy future uh, of the Ukrainian nation. Now, uh, the idea is to provide each and every government uh, who is supporting Ukraine an opportunity to clearly specify what kind of industry it is interested in. I think this is a very pragmatic and a very um, efficient approach that one should take. I think that um, it has a lot of potential we have been talking to different um, members of the Council of Europe, um, say the, the Dutch, for example, they're very interested in water management, the Germans in natural gas, uh, the, the Czech in metallurgy, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think there is nothing wrong uh, in having this very frank conversation with one with, with another and to discuss what kind of industries and sectors can be interesting to specific governments and their specific investors. Because then, if you take Turkey, for instance, uh, if you decide to take a specific sector and to become an anchor or a strategic investor in that kind of sector, then your government is able to develop some kind of the support program, the cheap loans or government security, and so on and so forth, to support your national investors that will be willing to enter the Ukrainian market. And it will be easier for everyone because you will have this kind of argument of what our country is doing in, in, in a state that is uh, at war. It's earning money there, earning money for your taxpayers as well, but also helping us to increase our resilience. Because for us, the, the argument is absolutely obvious and it's very logical. The best security guarantee Ukraine can have, and this is my personal opinion, is the presence of the foreign capital in its strategic sectors. This is the best security guarantee we can have. For you, as I mentioned before, this is an opportunity to enter new spheres, new sectors, new industries, and to start from scratch, and that means to become an anchor, a strategic investor for uh, a time being. Um, in terms of uh, what my um, uh, colleague Zaiga mentioned, uh, that we need to grow three times faster. <laughs> I think uh, it's, um, uh, it can be mathematically confirmed. Um, because if you take a very simple calculation, say your economy is worth $100 and it falls by 50% and it starts to be $50. So if you grow it back by 50%, your economy will be worth only $75. So this is simple math. And it means and it shows us that we need to grow at least twice faster than we have been falling. And uh, with the total assessment of the damages exceeding one billion uh, of dollars. Beg your pardon? Hundreds, no, uh, trillion, I meant trillion, sorry, trillion, one trillion of dollars. There is no way we can do it ourselves. And that is why we deadly, literally, need uh, our partners uh, to, to enter the Ukrainian markets, but we want you to enter it as partners. Not just, we don't want it to be, uh, you know, um, uh, we want it to be a joint venture. Uh, we, want it, we want it, we don't want to be a nation of beggars. We want it to be a nation of partners and we are ready to um, have a very pragmatic discussion on how to reconstruct Ukraine and, and, and how to save everyone's skins in the game uh, in, in doing so. Um, we have heard from all the three of you um, various aspects of the impact that the war is having on the world economy. And um, one might say that this is uh, a, sure, um, a sure symbol of the crisis of uh, globalization. And uh, if you take the last conference in Davos, uh, this was precisely the main topic. Is globalization dead? Do we need to get to regionalization, 
to save our countries from these dependencies, from these hostile dependencies, um, and uh, to try to rethink our cooperation. I would be really interested in your thoughts, uh, ladies and gentlemen. What do you think? Do, do we need a smarter form of cooperation? Do we need to rethink globalization in a smarter form? Or do we need a greater isolation uh, and uh, self-reliance of the economies? Um, if I could ask you to pick this question one by one, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, so I think what we need first is to get back to the rules-based world trade and order, because that has been really broken uh, with a war in, uh, uh, in, in Ukraine. So is uh, globalization dead? Uh, I don't think so, but it certainly is in reverse. Uh, because if you look back, uh, I mean, many countries benefited from uh, exporting or uh, carrying their production uh, to Asia and to, to other countries, which then uh, again uh, did uh, get into reverse very quickly with COVID and now with, with the war. So I think it's inevitable that there is some degree uh, and actually significant degree of nearshoring or bringing business back to, uh, to manageable proximity. Uh, and this is where I think uh, also Ukraine, but many other European countries, uh, but I would say also Turkey would uh, would benefit because also for Turkey, uh, European Union is is, is the largest uh, trading partner. So uh, I think we have always gained uh, with more trade between the nations. So this is where we need to get back. But before we get back, I think we, we, we need to, to make also sure that the rules uh, rules are followed. So, um, uh, uh, and for Estonia and also for Ukraine and I think for all European countries, uh, there is clearly a need for more investment in, uh, in innovation, in technology, uh, and this is what is happening. Uh, and again, I think Ukraine is well positioned to, to offer some, say, critical uh, raw materials, uh, a good uh, 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 edu educated people. So I think uh, there is a lot what we can do closer together. And then I hope we can again say that the globalization is moving to a right direction with a higher speed. When it happens, honest answer, I don't know. But uh, we should really make make it work because we, we, we gained a lot also for, uh, I think, uh, reducing the poverty globally. I mean, these things, I mean, trade has always helped, always. So the more we can trade, the better place the world will be. So let's work on uh, on making this to, to happen. Thank you very much. Gennady, do you think that this war of uh, in, in Ukraine has shown uh, an opportunity that trade should be increased and this can be... Uh, an instrument to to reach more a more peaceful and re resilient uh, community in the world, or is something like strategic autonomy is is the the way that we should follow? No, it's uh, it's very uh, easy and very difficult to answer to, uh, this question because from one side, point of view, the uh, uh, we we are feeling we are feeling something, uh, we are feeling what something happened. Happened for the uh, when I see uh, not about the war. I sp speak about the change in the world, the global world, and how everything will be. It's nobody uh, can to predict. There are a lot of forecasts, etc. From my point of view, uh, we uh, think uh, we are living in the situation when the technology and uh, uh, and the attitude to the uh, saving of the world will play a more important role. Do, do you see? If, for example, come back to the Ukraine and. Uh, uh, what what is the war? If I'm not aware, of course, it's a big specialist in the military operation. But a lot of people see what the war became. Uh, it's a little bit different. It's not when the uh, uh, war when we um, one thousand soldiers to one to the one thousand soldiers in one field stay and doing something. This is uh, we now are feeling what's the country who has a more. Uh, 
adaptive uh, military uh, weapons it's uh, to the new situation uh, it's working it will be the one of the main main trained uh, second one it's who controls the uh, uh, food it also will be the uh, more uh, successful my position I, I very often share with uh, with European Europeans in the, with European countries uh, maybe it's a little bit naive, but uh, I would like to share But the uh, situation when the Ukraine and the European Union unite, and this is, it will be win-win. Why? Because uh, if you see the last um, 10, 20 years, the, uh, some books, some uh, good monographies, uh, a lot of authors said what uh, uh, the epoch of Europe go, far, uh, go in the past. The new uh, countries, like the uh, new continent, like Asia, will be from, uh, for it will be the new focus of the on these countries. I'm not sure. Uh, honestly speaking, I'm not sure, because if we join, uh, for example, if we uh, unite uh, if, uh, possibilities of Ukraine and Europe, and uh, it will be in, only in the uh, agriculture sector. You, uh, Europe has everything in the agriculture sector. We add a lot of, and we can control opinion. Sorry, of course it's like this. Opinion of many countries in the world because we see what it is. You, Europe became one of the most important players, not only production of agriculture products, but also most important food processing. And for us, Ukraine uh, and Europe needed, uh, we would like to cooperate, not on the, to continue this story, what I said before, about breadbasket of Europe. Our idea is an absolutely different one. We would like to be the big supermarket of the world. This is more interesting, and where we can to produce. And uh, do you understand, the world, uh, if the, all the world like products from the Europe, Good quality, etc. It's very big influence, etc., etc. That's my my opinion. The global trade, the role uh, of the Europe together with new possibilities, it will be absolutely new, and we need to to take in uh, account this. This from my uh, this is my uh, uh, opinion. And one more uh, new technology became very important, and continents and uh, countries who control this. Uh, no, so control it a little bit. Who produced more and more will be the uh, will be the winner in in uh, in this ga uh, sorry, game. And uh, we see how Europe uh, go f forward in this direction. They, uh, uh, for example, I contacted with my colleagues from today from Bulgaria, from Slovakia, from France, etc. Everybody, every in all these countries, open new centers of new technologies. And what else? In Europe, 95% or maybe more, I don't know the statistic, people are very good educated and uh, has a huge potential in entrepreneurship. That's why I'm a little go, uh, when you're asking about the globalization, I go, uh, I like Europe. That's why, I'm sorry, it's, uh, I like Asia and uh, everything. But I'm, for me, it's always interesting to have a very interesting challenge. The, for Europe, everything is closed, or it's a new one, and will, it will be very big challenge for all uh, for Europe. We will find our place, or I don't like to see, say this was loser. No, we never will be the loser. Thank you. Thank you, Gennady. Um, now, Zaga, what do you think? Do do countries like Turkey or countries like Latvia should cultivate regional ties and regional uh, kind of alliances, and to rely more on their direct neighbors? Or should they invest in differentiating the supply chains and uh, to to you know to uh, reinvigorate the international trade in a way? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think regionally we are already linked because we are European Union, customs union with Turkey, and uh, certainly mentally we are as well having the same values, sharing them, and working together. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's extremely important to keep the global uh, values, uh, to keep the global value chains open. Uh, yeah, we certainly have now different trade. We will value the trade not only from trade openness, but as well from 
common values like-mindedness with us. I think that will be the uh, coming out of this crisis. That it is important that you have the strategic partnerships. We in Europe call them open strategic partnerships because, of course, it is that uh, one country has one raw material, another, another, and there should be uh, cooperation and uh, thinking together to do certainly technological development will uh, bring us to the new era. Yeah, we have now in Europe this twin uh, transition, digitalization, and uh, how to reduce uh, dependence on gas and how to get uh, greener. Uh, we will certainly as well manage that uh, challenge for us and uh, come out of this uh, not so easy situation currently with a much stronger setting what standards and cooperating and I think it's trade certainly helped to everybody to be open and uh, and, and uh, to have common interests uh, worldwide thank you thank you very much um, I think that a very important point has been made uh, regarding the new technologies uh, I think that this war has also shown how much new technologies um, are improving and are making you um, compatible um, in, in a way um, that you can face the new challenges. It, it, you might well know that a lot of Ukrainians, literally who are not serving in any army, they're just random citizens and people, have been photographing uh, military trade convoys of Russia, sending the coordinates to the Special Security Service, and this is all has been done through Telegram bots, DIA uh, application, and so on and so forth, and this is something that the world has never seen before. And this influx of the new technology in, into, into the war uh, gives us an outlook of how it is important in, in our regular life, and even take Turkey, the Bayraktar, I mean, this is the new technology that has, has dramatically changed the course of two wars already. And it, it has changed the course in the, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And now it's also changing the course of war in, uh, in, in Ukraine. This is, this is also very true. And uh, um, Andres was very right on t t talking about this, um, uh, the, um, the digitalization as well. And I think that the more a country transfers everything online to the digital, the more resilient it becomes. Um, but there is also one characteristic I would like to think uh, about, and this war has also proven that it's in cru in, in, in cru crucially important, this is speed. The fastest you are in this world, the fastest you can take decisions, the fastest you can react, the more advantage you have. And um, I would say that this is something that Ukraine will be bidding on um, in the in the closest future to become one of the fastest economies in the in the continent at least, and for that you need to be digitalized. You need to transfer everything to 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 digital as much as possible. You need to be also predictable, and predictability is a predictable tax system. Uh, it's a predictable migration system. It's a predictable custom system, um, and. This kind of speed it also increases um, the the intensities of transactions, so it makes your money more efficient in the economy. And the more efficient are the money in the economy, the less amount of money in the economy you need. And that is pure economic theory. So in a way, by increasing the speed of the economy and increasing the the intensity of transactions, you are taking away the burden of the inflation in a way and you're taking away the burden of the money mass that you have in your own economy. But you cannot increase the speed and the intensity of the transactions in, in economies and in states that are um, still operating uh, in the 20th uh, century's way, in an old-fashioned way. And that is when you need new technologies again. And I think that Ukraine has also a lot to to present in terms of the technology, in terms of the digital, um, starting with uh, DIA, as we have mentioned, and ending with um, uh, with other uh, in, in, in innovative ideas. But I think that that is definitely one of, of the things that we will be doing is on the fast state and the fast economy. And this war has proven that this is uh, an efficient tactic. 
Uh, is there is something else uh, we would like to discuss because we don't have one more speaker and we um, we we are ready to finish a bit earlier or is anybody be up for a lunch break earlier and uh, everybody might be hungry and we will let you go and have your meal ladies and gentlemen i think we can do it right oh we have a question yeah please sure Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. My name is Seda Hewitt, and I'm here to represent Hungarian Export Promotion Agency. Well, I'm here to represent myself, <laughs> that, that I can say. First of all, I would like to really thank you all, uh, the TGEIF uh, organization, especially the Tristan Evans to invite me to that uh, organization. I'm really happy to be here. I don't want to continue the same things, but I'm really here personally because I would like to be here in person. I'm not uh, here because uh, my uh, institution want me to come over here. I want to come here as SEDA because uh, I'm really sorry about the uh, hardship that Ukrainians are really experiencing even the exact same moment. And I would like to come over here just to say I'm here not only representing a government uh, institution, I'm here to represent Hungarian companies who actually would like to help Ukraine to rebuild again. I'm here to represent my friends, my Turkish friends, my Hungarian friends, my friends all over the world, so I can spread the world that what we can need, what we can do all together. So. I'm a very interactive person. I'm, I'm sorry for you know, standing up again. Because at first, I would like to observe what people are talking. I would like to hear from you what you need, what we can do for you, and what you can do for us. And after that, I would like to just stand up and uh, just tell what I think. I just would like to say I'm here, whatever I can do as a person, as Seda, I'm here, and I will really would like to speak to you, all of you, for the two days when you have time. Please be sure if you just see me, just tap on the shoulder, say hi. I'm sure we will find a common point to interact, to be friends or communicate again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sida. Uh, yeah. We are here for you as well. <laughs> Thank you. And one more thing, uh, I will uh, write a report about what we talk, what we all talked about, what we need about Ukraine. I don't care if they fire me, probably they can fire me, that's also a possibility. Because when you think about the, the situation of Hungary right now, but I will take the risk because as you said before, nicely put, brave will favor the, uh, future will favor the brave. So I just would like to stand up and be brave. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Anton Kononov. Uh, I came from Poland, but I'm Ukrainian. Uh, I have a question. Do we have some plans regarding decarbonization of our economy? Uh, the question is, um, why, why I'm asking about it? Because if we would like to become a, a member of the European Union, uh, we need to uh, harmonize uh, our uh, our law and uh, also in uh, energy sector so uh, as you may be know uh, in europe we have uh, uh, we have a um, co2 taxonomy so uh, so we are talking about co2 footprint and uh, all of business uh, all of companies, industry, and so on, and so on, and uh, heating and energy sector must to reduce CO2 emission, and uh, they pay for that emission. Um, more, moreover, uh, from uh, 2025, each product will be have their green certificate. So. Um, how much CO2 footprint has each 
each product. Uh, also, also we need to uh, become uh, independent from uh, Russian uh, natural gas and so on and so on. So my question is, do we have some plan how we can not only rebuild Ukraine and uh, its energy and uh, industry sector, but also decarbonize it and build independent industry and energy sector? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I think that this is a very timely question. Uh, because the baddest pollutant there is, is war. And this is as simple as that. Uh, to be frank, and I'm, sure, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I might sound harsh right now, but it makes no sense talking about the green future when there is war in the middle of Europe that is literally polluting with every missile that is being produced or is hitting a field or a building that it gets on fire then and it emits the CO2 and all the other uh, nasty stuff that uh, you mentioned. Um, this kind of pollution keeps on going and going and going and there is no way you can stop it. It, it only deteriorates, it gets even worse. Uh, because the production of the military equipment uh, is very pollutant. It's in fact one of the biggest pollutants in, in, in industry. And the war itself creates a lot of pollution. Now, um, another aspect of that is that uh, the war uh, that Russia has unleashed in Ukraine has changed the budgeting of all of the major European and Asian and other countries. And uh, with changing of those budgets in adding more money to the arms race to produce to the production of the security uh, and defensive weapons, it means that less money and less budget will be transferred in, in other programs, development programs like the CO2 or Green Deal. And this is another critical aspect we have to understand that as long as there is war in Ukraine or anywhere else in the war, uh, in, in the world, um, you will see less money in education, in uh, environment, in medicine, in any other programs that are designed to make a person's life longer and more peaceful. Because war makes a person's life shorter and more... Uh, um, more... Uh, hard. Sorry. So, if you might, if you might heard uh, regarding the UK, for instance, and this is just a quick example to give you, um, the gas crisis in the EU, because of the Russian gas blackmail, uh, has forced the UK to unseal the coal mines for the time being, to supply the power uh, that they lack in order to. Um, to, to provide heat to the population. So, and that is a simple example of what is the, the aftermath of this war and what are the, um, the, the consequences of it. So, um, it is a, a very important topic you're raising, absolutely important. And I think in reconstructing the country, once the war is over, we will have to make sure that this reconstruction is done in, in the green terms, right? But uh, before that, we need to make sure the war is over because we need to end the biggest pollution there is uh, as there is uh, out there now, and this is a war and uh, um, defense and uh, um, uh, defense industry and the defense product production sector. So that would be my short answer. Can I answer? Yes, please. please. Uh, I am Shev Kajan. I would say, question and a suggestion. The two uh, biggest challenges in reconstruction is resources and implementation. And I wanted you to tell the rest of the world how you are planning the implementation, including the governance of the implementation, because monies will be found, but the implementation will have to be taken charge by the Ukrainian people, Ukrainian politicians, and uh, so that is my 
question to you to communicate to us how you're preparing for that because we have to start it. Even though we're in the middle of the war, which we have to win, other work also has to go in parallel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dushaki. Um So we had a conference in Lugano uh, a month ago, maybe less, less, where hundreds of Ukrainian officials didn't manage to answer your question. <laughs> now you want me to try to do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, beg your pardon? Just a second, yeah, but uh, the truth is, jokes apart, the truth is that I think that nobody has this answer. Because even at Lugano, what we have heard is that the EBRD has its own view, the World Bank has their own view, the IFC has their own view, and the Ukrainian government has its own view. Oh. Now, what I would advocate for, and this is what I'm doing in my country, is to have this kind of, you have heard about the Rammstein, right? Uh, the, the military Rammstein, the, the meetings, where um, a number of ministers of defense have gathered and developed a, a, a single policy on the military assistance. We need an economic Rammstein. We need the same. But we need it to last for as long as it is required for all the decision makers and stakeholders to sit in one place for one day, two days, three days, four days, and go out with a clear policy of how this will be proceeded. I uh, briefly touched upon uh, your question in talking about this Brussels or Strasbourg plan, in talking to each and every government regarding specific spheres that industries that they might be interested in, and then drafting it in one single document or a roadmap. I think that would be a much more pragmatic approach, an approach that will be much more better understood by the governments. But um, still, there are deba debates on that. And um, unfortunately, there is no single answer or an easy answer to your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, and again, I First of all, uh, just a second. I would like to add what Mr. Shevkit said. It very important questions. Uh, we uh, tried to answer this question the last minimum 30 years. But uh, from my point of view, no any answer if the, our society will join, uh, uh, how to say, efforts. And for me, it's like a president of Chamber of Commerce. It's very interesting, very important. What uh, I never saw like it was before. The business started uh, last four, six months, joined. We would like to, to, to be the real player and in the ma making the decision in the post-war period as well. This is concerning also the civil society. No another way. If the civil society business uh, can't arise their voice, no choice. That's why my answer, we needed to support our government, we need to support our country, but uh, our voice should be uh, listened by them. Thank you. Thank you. Our dear friend from uh, Turkey, please. Yes. Um, we are from Georgia. Uh, from Georgia, all, I beg your pardon. Uh, I want to uh, say that it's an honor to be here. We are supporting Ukraine, uh, and uh, I have questions, and also we have some kind of uh, suggestions. Of course, we will discuss it with your colleagues uh, later also, but uh, uh, what is the main idea? Uh, we are uh, supporting Ukraine, and we like initiate uh, uh, act of support to Ukraine, and all Georgian construction and developer sector are ready to be involved. Uh, for this, uh, Ukrainian embassy in Georgia is working very hardly, and uh, very soon, uh, also it will be it will be like officially announced. Uh, also, we represent our uh, we work very closely with ASEAN Gulf countries with investors, and we uh, represent uh, Georgia in wet countries, and we already uh, discussed with them, and uh, where is the high readiness to be also involved in this process uh, to invest with projects in Ukraine. But uh, as you know, uh, and we hope very soon it will be possible and will be peace uh, at Ukraine. But uh, as you know, it's very uh, important to, uh, like to do business simply. Uh, are you going to simplify some kind, some regulations in Ukraine in these directions? Uh, because it will be very important for that moment. Thank you and success. Thank you very much. Just a quick answer to that and I will give you the floor, okay? Uh, um, yes, deregulation 
is an, a critical aspect of uh, the concept that I mentioned regarding the fast state and the fast economy. You simply cannot have any economies that might be called fast if the processes are taking you so long, as long as months, is, right, and even years sometimes. So without deregulating, without doing that regulation guillotine, any economy cannot call itself fast. And if you're not uh, a fast economy in this fastly changing world, then you die. So that's, that is a question to your answer, uh, an answer to your question, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, definitely we're, we're going to deregulate the, the business processes and um, to, to make them as predictable and as simple as possible. Thank you. Yep, the gentleman over there, please. We're not going to eat earlier today, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Karungu Peter from Johannesburg. I won't have missed this for any reason. It's an expression of solidarity among mankind. What we watch in Ukraine is painful, and I must say, it's unbearable. So I'm here to demonstrate solidarity among humanity. Second, there is an MP who spoke, Lisa. She was seated there. She has become one of the most women anchor we have ever seen on TV. She has motivated a lot of women, young, worldwide. Thank you to you, we can never, ever forget you. I'm a businessman, I'm a professor, I teach economics. She articulated something I will never forget, I teach it. Any business without a purpose and sustainability for the future of our children is doomed to fail. It's a question of how long it will take, I'm not sure. What do I do? I took a commitment to create women jobs worldwide. I didn't have money. I knew nothing. But I knew Johnson & Johnson, American company, sells a product an average 50 times what cost. I researched. I found it. I said, but we can do it. Today, I supply globally. I manufacture human spare parts, that's what I do. I manufacture sutures, wires, bridges, and now I'm designing human heart valve. It's selling worldwide. And the reason I'm saying this is because I would want to see how I can help Ukraine. I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman, highly emotional when I see pain, particularly impacted on women. It's too painful to bear. Uh, to Lisa, we will be with you as long as you will win. That I don't know whether that's her name, but I thought she's Lisa. She's somewhere seated, somewhere in front. She already left. So tell her we love her, we adore her, we will work hard until the end. We will win. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Just uh, my name is Thorsten Welt. I'm working for the European Commission in Ukraine normally. Now, because of the war, that's a bit uh, difficult. I'm working on energy session, so some of the questions that were raised we will definitely discuss in the energy session. But just one remark what is also important for the recovery and the industrial success is networking. It's, of course, also deregulation, rule of law, but it's also networking. And the EU is promoting, supporting industrial partnerships, which are networks uh, of partners where Ukraine can participate, lots of other partners. Uh, not, it's not only EU, it's centered EU, but not only EU. And I would like to encourage also when we do networking here to think about this, how we can use these uh, platforms. Uh, for instance, we have discussed uh, uh, renewable gases cooperation biomethane, green hydrogen, etc., as one of the axes of development for Ukraine, because Ukraine is a fossil fuel importer, but it can, can become easily a green energy exporter. Yeah, so it's a, it's, 
changing a weakness to a strength. And I think this should be our perspective here also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I agree with both of the speakers. And in terms of the networking, uh, I would... Uh, I would like to make a very important statement here. What uh, we have been working lately uh, with some colleagues from the UK Parliament is, for example, an introduction of the uh, humanitarian safe harbor status of the support of Odessa uh, in order to um, try to unlock it and to secure the export of the grain from that port because, if, uh, as you might know, it exports more than 50% of uh, the Ukrainian export. Uh, now, in order to do that, we would need a vote in the General Assembly of the United Nations. That is the only way to do it. And uh, I, will, I would like to ask everyone representing your own nation to give it a thought on whether your country might support such a decision in the United Nations General Assembly. And that is an aspect of the networking, as uh, you mentioned. And this is the networking, the networking I'm doing right now, trying to address you to take it to your governments, to your countries, to support this decision, because I think this will ease the pain from the food security uh, crisis that is there uh, for everyone. Um, there was one last question we can take from a lady. I don't see her. Maybe she's... I'm here. Hi. Sorry. So I'm Hilal Sare from Dunya Daily Economics, the one and only eco daily economics of Turkey, actually. So my question will be regarding the possible post-war uh, economic uh, partnership between our countries. Uh, my question will be, which sectors are in focus? I see one of our huge construction companies, so I take it as one of the obvious sectors, but what are the focus sectors for bilateral uh, partnership? And my second question is about the food crisis and the controversial claims about the uh, uh, stolen grain uh, and the current ongoing negotiations about the grain corridor in Black Sea. Uh, so, yeah, that's all. My questions are for the board. Thank you. Um, I'll start from the from the end. So yesterday, my colleague, deputy and MP also, and the negotiator, uh, Rustem Umero, who might be well known uh, here in Turkey, uh, he reported that there is an argument to um, blockade three Ukrainian por ports uh, in the Black Sea, to deblocate them. Um, the port of Odessa, which actually provided about 50% of Ukrainian export, is also on the list. Uh, it hasn't been finalized yet, but there seems to be some progress there, hopefully. I don't see any con anything controversial regarding the statements of the stolen grain because uh, this is a fact that has been confirmed by a number of different institutions. Unfortunately, Russia does that. Uh, regarding the, the opportunities uh, of cooperation, um, so I would, I would divide um, everything in, two, in three big chunks. Chunk number one is something we need right here, right now, to stop this war as fast as possible. And that means that the first chunk of investments that we badly need today is something to produce uh, defense or offense equipment. Um, I'm talking about an, a plant that, produce, that is producing bullets, uh, a plant that is producing um, drones, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is top priority right now. If we can do that, um, that is the something that will literally save lives and make this war shorter. The second big chunk of investments we need right now is to ease the suffering of random people. And that means basic infrastructure. That means housing, that means uh, water supply, that means uh, energy supply, roads, um, and so on and so forth. So everything that will um, provide the opportunity for Ukrainians whose houses have been destroyed, whose cities have been destroyed, to start a decent life somewhere else uh, in a small apartment, in a small private house. Um, and for that, we need materials, we need construction uh, companies, and uh, uh, we need some, some, some basic uh, infrastructure. That is chunk number two. And chunk number three is basically reinvigorating uh, the sectors and uh, stimulating export. And uh, for that reason, um, 
where those um, investments uh, might go are, of course, metallurgy, uh, grain, uh, agriculture sector, um, and all other sectors that have been generating export uh, value um, in the last couple of uh, decades in Ukraine. So those three big chunks um, are a very general overview of uh, where the money, I think, might go to. If you want to take any chunk precisely, specifically, then you can go and, and into details and uh, easily uh, find a, a small project uh, with which you can start um, attracting investors uh, to, to this specific project. Thank you. Objection, yeah, of course. Uh, let's go for the objections. Yeah. Uh, regarding, uh, regarding my question, uh, my objection is, uh, you said that it's not time to think about ecology. Okay, maybe you're right, the war is for sure a more, more important thing, but I mean uh, something, another thing, that, uh, for example, nowadays the natural gas is so expensive that it is cheaper to produce green hydrogen to, um, for example, uh, for example, not only for make electricity like energy storage, but for example, in uh, industry, uh, industrial process, uh, in um, in metallurgical uh, steel plants, in uh, agriculture sector, and uh, now we we uh, can produce green ammonia from the green hydrogen. It is will it will be cheaper than grey ammonia they uh, that produced from um, natural gas. So I mean that it is it is um, good for our economic. F uh, the first one, the second one, we will be independent from the uh, natural gas from Russia, and the third one, we will be green. Yes. So uh, I I mean that it is economical. It has, uh, has economical efficiency, yes. Not only uh, ecology, yes, but uh, but it's, it will be cheaper. And uh, if someone uh, wants to reduce their costs by natural gas and their production facility, you are welcome. Uh, in in Europe, it is um, rather uh, rather well known things. Not not so on, but. But uh, but our company helps helps industry and uh, central heating and uh, fertilizers production facilities with green ammonia, for example, to to increase the costs to become green and to become independent. That's what I mean. That was my objection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think there is something to object for, object for because, uh, of course, it's always time to talk about uh, um, ecology. For instance, we were very much uh, worried uh, regarding the Russians occupying Chernobyl or the Parisian nuclear plant, uh, which might have become a new tragedy and a catastrophe for the whole world, again, in case a missile would hit uh, one of those objects. So uh, ecology is always important. Nevertheless, uh, if you're taking ammonia as an example, then uh, I'll tell you this. The capacity to produce enough green ammonia um, through a process that is called electrolysis, isn't it right, that produces hydrogen, uh, I'm afraid it's present only on the Odessa plant, uh, Opaza, the, the Odessa port plant. Now, do you reckon how much money would you need to refurbish the Opaza in order to produce, start producing hydrogen enough to feed all the Ukrainian capability? I would think that there are like tens of millions, maybe billions probably, and then to improve the, the infrastructure that is carrying that uh, hydrogen throughout the country and maybe even to Europe. So while that is a very good idea and a brilliant example of where money might be invested into, I think that um, as of today we will be finding ourselves in a very difficult position to replace uh, Ukrainian natural gas towards hydrogen or green ammonia in times of war. This is my opinion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now at 12.47. Uh, I would like to thank the brilliant uh, members of the panel. Thank you very much. Let's give, let's give them an applause.
And thank you very much, everybody, for this insightful discussion. See you at the lunch. Thank you. Before you leave, I just wanted to remind that for the lunch, uh, it's going to be until 2 p.m. And one more reminder, please, for our dear speakers and sponsors and Platinum uh, guests. There will be a boat at uh, 7.30 p.m. from Demtur Avrasia Kabataj port. Uh, and Aydin Sadat will be the name of the boat. And we are waiting for you also there, just quickly reminding that. And bon appétit for everyone. Afiat Olsun. And hope to see you at 2 p.m. So I'm just waiting for...
Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, we will start shortly. I'm just waiting for everyone to come back from lunch. And the next panel will be on the changing face of foreign direct investment challenges and opportunities. I will just make a short summary. And uh, I want to also remind you for our dear speakers and sponsors and for our Platinum VIP guests, we, there will be a boat at 7.30 p.m. that's going to be leaving from Demtur Avrasia port, and uh, you are all welcomed there. So, shortly we will be starting with our panel discussion. We'll be discussing of the current needs and forecasts for international business relocations and the cooperative approach being adopted internationally to ensure that support is available when needed for businesses already invested in Ukraine and in the region. What are the changes being seen in investor confidence and how are the government IPAs overcoming these challenges will be one of our subjects. How different government IPAs are supporting temporary business relocations, maintaining an eye towards a future return and rebuilding effort, rather than a permanent absorption of Ukrainian firms and talent by host countries. Identifying and promoting new investment opportunities, particularly where the global community is seeing production service shortages. And I want to also introduce shortly our speakers. Invest Bulgaria Executive Director, Mr. Bogdan Bogdano will be with us. From Investment and Development Agency of Latvia, Deputy Director in Charge of Export, Ivata Struvkaya will be with us. And from Czech Investment, Director of Investment and Foreign Operations, Eva Jungmanova will be with us. From Invest Moldova, Director General, Mr. Stelian Manik will be with us. From IDA Ireland, Global Head of Strategy, Policy and International Financial Services, Mr. Kieran Dono will be with us. And from Ukraine Invest, Chief, Ex Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Sergi Surufkaj will be with us. But he will be connecting online. I want to just inform that he's also now with the Ukrainian army. So he's not in office, but he will try to join us. And we are hoping that we will be. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. So this is good news. And I want to welcome also Mr. Sergei Sukac. And then also for Estonian Business and Innovation Agency, Head of Exports Advisor Team, Mr. Sven Orlik is with us. And finally, I will be calling on stage our moderator and also managing director of Germany, Trade and Invest, and chair of OECD Network of Investment Promotion Agencies, Mr. Achim Hartig, please. Maybe some energy to rise. This is one of our most important panels. Yes, so I'll be handing this microphone over to you, Mr. Rahim. And the second microphone for our speakers. Um, maybe I'll, yes. Thank you. So we have, uh, we are quite flexible, but we have one hour, 30 minutes. And I'm here if you need. Well, thank you very much, um, Boja. Thank you very much. And um, it's a pleasure to see you all here, and there's probably a fairly amount of people watching online today, and uh, it's a pleasure because the subject is important, uh, which we are discussing today, and the economic impacts of the war in Ukraine. Um, and today and right now, we will be talking about foreign direct investments and how far they are affected in adjacent countries. Um, I have the pleasure to moderate this panel here. First of all, um, it's after lunch, and uh, we all know how we feel after lunch. And uh, probably there would be some humor um, indicated to, to freshen up the atmosphere, but they put a German as a moderator, so you cannot expect much here. Still, um, I'll try to um, still I'll try to fill you with some content about what's going on uh, in the foreign direct investment section in these different countries. So, foreign direct investments are part, um, um, not only in my understanding, of stabilization, 
um, of political bonds and economical bonds. If you invest in a country, be it greenfield or brownfield, you do mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, you always have relations to specific assets in that country and vice versa. By doing that, um, you mitigate risks in your own country and you also um, create bonds between two countries. These bonds stabilize. And now it's an interesting question in how far the stabilization of bonds is something which is deteriorated throughout uh, through the war in, in the Ukraine, and also in how far these bonds can be changed, can be, um, can be adapted to the new situation so they can help Ukraine to rebuild and stabilize their economy. I would like to start with uh, introducing, um, introducing the panelists and would like to, um, to ask each panelist to give a short introductory statement. I would like to start with uh, Iveta Strupkaya, Deputy Director in Charge of Export, Investment uh, and Development of the Agency of Latvia. Mrs. Strupkaya, please. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Excellencies, entrepreneurs, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank organizers and volunteers for organizing this great event and, of course, for having me as a panelist. And uh, yeah, maybe before I describe uh, economic situation and the challenges we face and changes in the process of attracting investment, I would like to say a few words about the agency I represent. Despite the name, the Investment and Development Agency of Latvia, um, we doesn't we we. We don't have uh, only one function, attraction of investment. Actually, the second function is uh, promotion of export, including tourism. And we also um, um, and uh, we are, we are also responsible for coordination of of the creation of a unified state image. And uh, what else? We have a representative office in Ukraine. Currently, colleague is working from Riga. And as you see, we don't complain about uh, lack of, of work. Uh, just like other countries uh, um, and the whole global economy, we haven't been able to complete to completely avoid the impact of the irresponsible uh, actions of Vladimir Putin's Russia by invading Ukraine again and waging a full-scale war. And uh, let's say, once upon a time, Latvia has been one of the countries that has proved its resilience by achieving quick recovery after COVID-19 pandemic. It reached 4.7 growth in 2021 after only a minor recession in 2020. Meanwhile, export growth in 2021 reached uh, almost 24% compared to 2020. And the cumulative FDI reached a uh, record of 21 billion euros in 2021, with Sweden and Germany being among top five sources of FDI. <clears throat> And the forecasted FDI growth for for this year has been set at 2.9%, which means slower recovery but not recession. And uh, in these challenging times, we continue working with potential investors and keep presenting Latvia as a safe and attractive place for investment. And um, yeah, if we are talking about Latvia, Latvia is a diverse, digitally advanced and cost-efficient country, which is a part of the European Union and North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, Latvia is the most startup-friendly country in the world, as stated by Index Venture in 2021. And we have the largest share, 45% uh, of women in management in the EU. We have more than 120 government services available remotely and we offer digital ID for signing documents. And currently mm, there are six smart sectors which interest us at most. These are biomedicine, bioeconomy, smart energy, smart materials, photonics, ICT and smart city. And to promote investment that would lead uh, the development of our country in desirable direction, we have introduce large-scale financial support for value-added uh, projects. 
we are offering a, a range of incentives for upskilling, training, development, knowledge transfer, management, education, and also we are providing so-called green corridor, uh, that is fast track procedures for smart investment and support for uh, innovations. And if you are talking about previous year, we were doing pretty well. In 2021, Investment and Development Agency of Latvia has attracted uh, more than 643 million euros or 32 new investment projects in already mentioned uh, smart uh, sectors. I think, I believe that uh, we have adapted to changes and are determined to be uh, to be responsive to future challenges. And of course, we are working uh, very closely with colleagues from Ukraine, realizing different uh, investment projects in both countries. Currently, uh, in our pipeline, there are three projects from uh, Ukraine. And I believe that, uh, that we, will, we will work on them very fastly, quickly, and effectively. Thank you. Mr. Rupkaya, thank you very much. Um, it's interesting to hear that uh, especially the diversity in the terms of the digital economy helps a lot, of course, to become resilient and to give a lot of dots to connect also for other economies to do business with. Um, as next, um, as next uh, panelist, I would like to ask uh, Stelian Manik um, to give his introductory statement. Stelian, please. Just a second. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Just a short introduction. Uh, about the Invest Moldova. <clears throat> so, um, um, probably many of you know that uh, one year ago uh, we got a new government, probably the first government during the independence of this small country during the 30 years, that is a really pro Westic uh, government that is involved in a very deep transformation and reforms of the country. So the agency is responsible um, for, uh, of course, investment attraction, investment protection. Uh, it, is, uh, it has the mandate of uh, uh, export promotion and country brand promotion. Uh, I will just try to be very brief. Um, the, uh, Moldova is a really small country, but it could be a very good bridge between the East and the West. So it's so small that even today, one of a friend, a speaker from Ukraine, missed to mention the Western countries, Western neighbors, missed to mention Moldova. <laughs> so, uh, well, that means that we have a lot to work about the image or country brand of Moldova. So. Uh, why Moldova today can be a real bridge between East and West. Moldova has a, um, a free trade agreement with European Union, has th three trade agreement with Baltic countries, Turkey, and also is still a part of former Soviet Union countries, CSI. Which means that actually if you produce something in the Republic of Moldova, you easily can export those goods 1,000 kilometers to the east and 1,000 kilometers to the west. <clears throat> so, uh, as I promised, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, uh, today, uh, we go through, all uh, Moldova go through a uh, very deep transformation, and today, the Invest Moldova as well is trying to get a new face. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, I would like uh, to ask uh, Eva Yumanova, Director of Investment and Foreign Operations of Czech Invest, to give her introductory statement. Eva, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today with you to discuss such an important topic. And also, I'm very honored to be here on behalf of the Czech Republic, which is currently probably most important uh, country in the European Union as we have the EU presidency for the next six months. So we are going to coordinate all the uh, talks and discussions and working groups on uh, most important topics as Ukraine, energy crisis, transformation of, of economy and so on. 
so let me just briefly introduce Czech Invest. Um, I'm really happy that I can also meet our my colleague from other countries because it's always great to share best practices, same experience. And um, I have to say we are a little bit different than other inv uh, investment promotion agencies because most of them, they also focus on export, where we have another agency for export. But uh, Czech Invest is more moving towards innovation. And we uh, have also big department to support Czech startups and, uh, and innovative Czech companies. And we try to merge them with the foreign investors, which we already had in the country. Um, Foreign, invest foreign investments has been a big topic for us last 30 years uh, since the, the transition to, uh, to open economy. We are a very export-oriented uh, export country. We have close ties to Germany and our largest uh, industry is automotive. So we are very much um, influenced by anything what's happening uh, in the markets right now. Um, and when I look at the relationship with, with Ukraine, uh, we, there has always been some cooperation, some economic activity, but I think we have many opportunities now to, to um, build uh, closer ties and stronger, stronger bonds and uh, create better supply chains also in the, in the whole region. So thank you very much for having me here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Eva. I think what already the presentations of the panelists show up to now is that uh, this unfortunate situation of the war in Ukraine puts an entirely new focus and entirely new perspective on how economic relations function between countries. We're going to deep dive into that later on when we will talk about what kind of FDI projects there will be and there are in the country and also what kind of value chains might be effective. But uh, before we do this, I would like to ask Bogdan Bogdanov, Executive Director of Investor Bulgaria, for his introductory statement. Mr. Bogdanov, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from me as well. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here today and to present our investment agency, but not only that, to be among colleagues that we more or less share the same vision, vision of unity, vision of uh, cooperation, vision that uh, can make our region, not only our region, but Europe in general, uh, a better place to be and a safer place to be. Bulgarian Investment Agency, uh, it's been out there for more than 30 years. It used to be part of the Ministry of Economy. Uh, last year, uh, we started a reconstruction of our country, which was postponed for years. And part of this reconstruction, we put a strategic focus on investments, but also on the Bulgarian startup ecosystem. As part of this transition, uh, investment agency has been moved to a dedicated ministry now that uh, we uh, created at the end of last year, Ministry of Innovation and Growth. And under the Ministry of Innovation and Growth, we have from one side the investment agency, the agency for small and medium-sized uh, companies, but also the European funding, the Bulgarian uh, Bank for Development, and also uh, part of uh, venture capital ecosystem. The idea is to have under one place um, all the different institutions that can contribute in the long term in developing our economy. The agency um, has um, a very simple way forward. And uh, the, the way forward is that we can be and we have to be closer to, to the existing ecosystem of investors in Bulgaria to understand better their business model, their needs, their challenges, and also to connect this ecosystem with the new investors that we are talking to now. And of course, as every other region or a country, we have certain priority sectors that we can see really adding value to the investors. Part of these are, of course, automotive sector, which is a great example of growth in Bulgaria. For less than 10 years, we managed to grow from 1% of GDP in the automotive sector to more than 11% of GDP today, with more than 70,000 people directly employed in the automotive sector. But besides that, we have a very strategic focus in the automotive sector, focusing on uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, battery production, but also uh, electric vehicles. Um, among other sectors are mechatronics, electronics, we have also chemistry and biotech, and uh, also sector which have been historically well developed in Bulgaria, 
uh, when we talk about microelectronics uh, and also equipment for the semiconductor industry. These are uh, one of the key strategic sectors which we are betting on, but at the same time, um, we are looking into the ecosystem. When an investor comes in Bulgaria, it's part, uh, it becomes part of the ecosystem. And as part of this ecosystem, from one side, they have access to all the incentives that the government can provide, financial and non-financial ones, but also we are supporting the investors with their further development. Uh, again, um, through the European funding, through the national funding, and just to give you an example of what our government did for the business in the last six months. Just in the last six months, with direct uh, grants and subsidies to the business because of the situation we are now, the government uh, dedicated more than 2.5 billion euros, which were directly focused to the business, covering uh, utility expenses, covering uh, fuel prices. We also make a cap now on the price of electricity in Bulgaria. Why? Because Bulgaria is a net exporter of electricity in the region, so we produce a lot more than we need. As you may know, Bulgaria was one of the first countries that uh, the gas was completely stopped from Russia without any uh, further notice. Uh, it has been just stopped. Uh, and now our government managed to develop a very strategic infrastructure, the interconnector with Greece, in less than six months, something that has not been done for 10 years. And here is the example how strong we can be together. And if we develop this uh, regional cooperation, we can be more efficient and it can be better not only for our country, but also for our region. And last but not least, uh, we are really relying on cooperation. And um, when we are talking to uh, investors, one of the major aspects is, again, I will repeat it, to become part of this ecosystem. And um, uh, in, the, in the near future, one of the main focus should be first shorter the investment cycle. So from average six months, which has been years ago, we recently managed to close an investment uh, with a big US company in the medical sector for less than eight weeks, uh, which is a good example. This is the benchmark. Um, in terms of our cooperation uh, with Ukraine, we have a very strong um, connection um, from the past. There is a big Bulgarian speaking diaspora in Ukraine. So language is very close. So when this um, horrible war started, um, we've seen um, um, people moving from Ukraine, but also businesses trying to move to Bulgaria. And maybe I will leave that to the next question because there will be what measures we have undertaken to support the Ukrainian business because we've been really proactive in that approach, signing contract with the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce under the investment agency so that we can create this relation um, in a solid way and companies, people that are coming to Bulgaria because they are forced to do that, to have the right access to resources, to the labor market, to our social system, even to the schools for their kids. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and I hope we have a, a very open and frank discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bogdanov. Strong case. Next, I would like to ask Kirian Donahue, Global Head of Strategy, Policy and International Financial Services of the IDA Ireland, to give his statement. Uh, thank you, Akram, and good afternoon, everyone. I represent IDA Ireland, the Irish government's foreign direct investment agency. I'm very pleased to join you all at today's forum. In cooperation with our EU partners and the government of Ukraine, the Irish government has provided humanitarian and other support to Ukraine over the last five months and will continue to do so. Our thoughts and prayers are very much with the people of Ukraine at this tragic and difficult time. Uh, a few brief comments, if I may, about IDA Ireland. We were established more than 70 years ago. Our primary role is to attract uh, foreign multinationals to locate in Ireland. We have constructed a portfolio of more than 1,700 companies over the last 70 years. These companies are drawn from a range of sectors, technology, life sciences, financial services, business services, etc. Over half of the portfolio are US multinationals and the rest come from the United Kingdom, Germany, France, uh, Japan and China. Um, the current direct trade and economic links between Ukraine and Ireland are quite modest, less than half of 
percent in relation to merchandise trade and a similar statistic for services. We did establish an embassy in Kiev in 2021, and we hope this will be the foundation upon which we will grow and develop more bilateral economic, social, and cultural ties. We haven't seen any corporate relocations from Ukraine to Ireland in the first five months of the, of the conflict. Today's panel, as Akim said, is about the changing face of foreign direct investment. So some brief introductory remarks about that uh, topic um, from me. We have seen, seen changes in foreign direct investment, but we've also seen a lot of continuity. So multinationals in their discussions with us continue to prioritize the importance of access to markets, access to skills, access to innovation, access to a stable public policy environment, and to an operating location that provides reasonable operating costs and reasonable taxation. Certainly in a post-COVID-19 con context, we have seen some changes, especially the degree to which more and more companies are operating remotely, um, organizing their structures around the availability of key staff and their needs um, and wants. And we've also seen uh, a move to more dispersed models, um, a very interesting um, development in a cross-border context. We've also seen a significant increase um, in, in emphasis upon resilience, risk management, climate action, and the stability, capacity, and capability of operating locations, and increased interest in the public policies that underpin the operating environment. It's important to acknowledge that the risk ratings of up to 60 countries have been downgraded by analysts since February of this year, and that is beginning to shape investment decision-making by large global firms. The other two key areas where we've observed significant uh, developments, and I won't go into them uh, in detail at this phase uh, of the discussion, is firstly around sentiment. So how the decision makers and multinationals feel about the operating environment and how that alters and shapes their psychology and their decision making processes. And secondly, and even more interesting in some respects um, than sentiment, is narrative. It's the language that is now being used by senior decision makers when you're sitting in rooms having discussions with them about investment. So whereas multinationals traditionally would emphasize costs, emphasize profits, the benefits of locating in a particular jurisdiction, the economics, if you will, of the investment decision-making process, increasingly multinationals are now looking at everything through a geopolitical and geostrategic lens. And language like deglobalization, decoupling, friendshoring, strategic autonomy, um, the development of regional alliances and the reconfiguration of supply chains, that's become a much, much stronger feature of the conversations that we're having with them, and we suspect it will be a feature for the foreseeable future. So I'll leave it there for now. Again, great pleasure to join you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. We already... <clears throat> Thank you. We already dived a little bit into the, into the subjects, what kind of criteria there are um, for investments and what goes on in the background. And we know that businesses are, in most cases, pretty agnostic when it comes to political systems. Um, in the end, profit is for many, many companies the, the main driver. And here we are um, emphasizing passion in business decisions and also highlighting the options to, in a changing world of value chains, to think about other countries maybe when reorganizing value chains and getting suppliers on board instead of, uh, instead of the usual path which has been taken before uh, the Russian war in the Ukraine. Mr. Svenaulik um, is the next panelist, head of exports advisors team of the Estonian Business and Innovation Agency. Sven, I would like to ask you to take the floor. Thank you, Achim. Um, actually, I would like to start with that, that uh, it happened somehow that I'm the third Estonian on stage today already, and I was a little bit afraid that uh, my colleagues, dear colleagues, have already told most of the our oh, good achievements and our messages. Luckily, I have some more. So please be patient. But before we reach that point, uh, maybe uh, a couple of words of Enterprise Estonia, which I represent. We are a very similar organization to LIA Latvia, 
but very different from our Czech colleagues that we are also having it under the same roof our investment agency, our trade promotion agency and tourism agency, plus a couple of more things. And um, in, uh, in terms of um, sanctions and the situation currently in Estonia, uh, we were lucky in a way that uh, and the sanctions did not affect Estonia so much because uh, already uh, a couple of years ago we started to reduce our dependency on uh, exports, especially to Russia, for example. And when the uh, war broke out, we, uh, only from our, our exports, total 2% of our exports went go to Russia. Of course, the other way, the imports is definitely the problem and the supply chain had to be changed. But nevertheless, that uh, is a good news. And uh, of the official statistics, of course, uh, it was mentioned already that uh, inflation in Estonia this year has reached already 20% due to the events in Ukraine. Uh, there, are some, there is something else on top of it that uh, the reason that uh, in Estonia it's a bit higher than the rest of the Europe. But the good news is that this is still an economic growth and uh, it will grow uh, also hopefully next year and uh, even our wages are, st uh, are growing quite well so in the, in overall the economical situation in Estonia is is quite good and um, there is one more thing I want to say as an introduction uh, about Estonia yes that uh, Estonia is actually known by the other name and when we go to the trade fairs around the world uh, our slogan usually the name of the country is not just Estonia we are called E Estonia because Estonia is actually and it's not the bragging thing that it is the most digitally advanced country in the world with 99% of our uh, governmental and private services being available online there are uh, as and that's and that's not the joke now there are only two things you can't do in Estonia digitally can you think what are these two things? Everything. These, are, these two things are getting married. This is usually too, quite polite to show up on your wedding, right? So we do it the traditional way. And getting divorced, that's another thing that, that, that lawyers, you want to make sure that the lawyers do the right decisions in the end. Te technically, they're actually possible, but we keep this traditional life. <laughs> and uh, why, why I'm talking about the Estonia is that uh, we have been in uh, long-term relations with Ukrainians already for around 20 years. And what my colleagues, Mr. Mr. Sweet mentioned that we are helping them and they are very advanced in digital. Um, I, I must admit that uh, the steps we started 20 years ago, when we started our e-journey, we started the cooperation with Ukrainians and when the war broke off, we went even more far away. So the backbone of Ukrainian digital government services are actually having Estonian origin. And we have given that to Ukrainians for free without any charging any, any uh, uh, fees for that. So we are really glad that the, our achievements have already reflected on the uh, Ukrainian economy and helped a lot them during the war. And I'll stop in here at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven. And it's a beauty to see a round of applause. <laughs> It's a beauty. It's a beauty to see um, that already there are um, connections done in that case in the digital way how to cooperate with Ukraine. And speaking about Ukraine, I was gambling against the Zoom connection. I'm very happy um, Zergi Chivkac is still with us and the connection is holding. Zerg, do you hear us? I might have been slightly too optimistic about the sound connection. He's trying hard. Well, he's trying hard. He's typing. He, he's typing. Okay. Who has the chat box open? Please translate. The office, we are in a warm hole Hello, here. Yes, oh. you can hear, okay. You can hear me. Okay, so good to hear you. Um, very good. I'm, I'm not sure if the sound was uh, was um, connected you to your... Me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Obviously, there's a long delay until uh, the sound gets transported. Sound. 
And if you can hear, if you can hear us, um, I'm using the delay to um, to ask the question because if you look at um, Ukraine Invest, it would be great if you can give an introduction as a CEO of um, Ukraine Invest about your organization. And of course, um, although it might be obvious, um, give a brief picture about the current situation of foreign direct investments reaching and leaving the Ukraine from your perspective. It's a translation of your speech. I'm so happy it works. Dear team, uh, dear esteemed colleagues from investment promotion agencies and dear organizers, thank you very much for this opportunity. The opportunity to talk to you about other uh, developments in Ukraine, about what we do. Just briefly about Ukraine Invest. We were established in 2016 and moved to a full fledged uh, institution, state institution in 2019. Since then, we have managed to attract more than 5 billion US dollars to Ukraine, helped to uh, develop regulatory policies, uh, assisted investors, you know, just doing all those things that uh, you do for businesses in your countries as well. Uh, Ukraine in 2019-2020 uh, did a lot
stronger, more resilient, and more reliable supply chains. I believe that investment is the language of peace. Because when countries invest, when countries invest in each other, there will be no place of war. And I wish that this experience that happened to Ukraine will never be repeated anywhere throughout the world. Therefore, I'm counting on cooperation with our partners, and we're going to think how to engage investors from throughout the world in our region specifically. I'm very happy to see my colleagues and partners from Estonia, Moldova, Czech Republic, from Ireland, from all, all other countries. Because we need to think how to make this world better, more peaceful, and more resilient to challenges that we could never expect in the 21st century. This is an opening statement, and I would like to uh, answer any questions and participate in all other discussions that will follow. There we go. Thank you, Sari. Thank you very much for this for the statement and uh, taking your statement into account and also the ones we heard from the from the panelists here. Um, they all they all presented their service portfolio in one way or the other. And when we are looking at the situation in Ukraine and also in the adjacent countries, um, there's a lot of complexity going on. And investors they might not be sure about how to proceed. Um, if to proceed and when, then where and in which volumes. So one of the major jobs all these investment and trade promotion agencies have, and they are executing it uh, um, excellently, is to reduce complexity on the way to a country. And here we are in a special situation that we have to relieve, or we have to make the facts transparent to reduce the complexity. So the next question is about specific, about FDI, about FDI projects. Maybe not individual projects, because this might be a sensitive issue for some, for some companies, but we, let's talk about industries, and maybe that we have an idea about what scale there is um, in these industries. So uh, we would be interested, I would be interested in what kind of industries and FDI projects connect your country, connects your country with the Ukraine. This would be interesting to hear, so that we can have, an, have, a, have a kind of imagination. Um, what kind of uh, yeah, what kind of anchor points there are in the Ukraine, and in the countries we are talking about? What kind of FDI projects are, connect your country with the Ukraine? I'd like to start uh, with uh, Stelian Manich. Thank you. So, uh, in uh, this way, I'll mention probably two uh, uh, two things, two opportunities that arise uh, because of this uh, war. So, um, to mention is that uh, the now uh, Ukraine has opened really open only the western uh, border, and almost half of the border is uh, today goes through uh, Republic of Moldova. Uh, another thing that I uh, would like to mention here about the border is that uh, more than half of that border is uh, say on the eastern part of Moldova we got Transnistria, that's a territory that is controlled by Russia. <clears throat> and now can you imagine the fact that now all these uh, traffic goes through Moldova, goes through just several points. So uh, in the first part of, uh, say, when the, the, the war just started, that was a real nightmare on the borders. <clears throat> OK, today the situation there is much better uh, due to the very good cooperation between the Moldovan and Ukraine board, uh, customs and Moldovan and Romanian customs. So talking about this opportunity, I would say that the um, Republic of Moldova now can develop uh, and become in the future a, a real transportation hub in the region. Uh, so, and be a very good corridor uh, in the new situation, because even if we can imagine that tomorrow the war will stop, there is no any, uh, we cannot be sure that actually the Nikolaev, the Odessa ports and all other Ukrainian ports will 
be open, which means that the traffic will continue to go, a uh, big part of the tra traffic will continue to go through Moldovan territory, which means that it's a very good opportunity to, to our country to become a logistic hub. And uh, the investments in uh, this um, sector today probably are very, very welcome. And the second thing that I, uh, uh, I'd like to say about is that the risk of the uh, food uh, uh, supply, supply in the world. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, Moldova is a very, very big uh, producer of uh, different agricultural goods. But the issue is that uh, uh, we are uh, exporting uh, more, uh, more of raw materials. So probably another big opportunity to invest in the Republic of Moldova due to the new condition of war is to invest in processing of agricultural goods. Thank you. Okay, very good. So already the logistics, um, the logistics can be a, a connecting factor, especially in border regions. And if you have a logistics center in one country, it's easy to migrate trade and even other logistic uh, centers into into the Ukraine in the end, so that you extend the network um, of your business and you provide more services. That's for the example of uh, of Moldova. I wonder how is it in the Czech Republic. Thank you. So I looked at the numbers, what we have for FDIs with, together with, uh, between Czech Republic and Ukraine for both outbound, outbound and inbound investments. And from the history, there is uh, one investment project from Ukraine in Czech Republic in financial services. And uh, in the other way, there are 20, 21 projects from Czech Republic in Ukraine, which can be seen as a small number, but considering the size of our country and also that we are mostly receiver of, of uh, FDI, then I think it's it's uh, quite interesting. And even more interesting is the structure of the investments, because 40% of those investments went to renewable energies. Uh, most of them were greenfield investments, but we also have companies who already successfully expanded in, in Ukraine. Most of them are located in the western part, near Kiev, but uh, we have also quite a strong base of companies uh, in the area of Dnipro. And um, I think that would be also great to, to in the future, to grow this, uh, this existing community of Czech companies and bring there more. Uh, current war uh, intensified the interest of, of investors in both countries. So Czech Invest uh, currently talks to over 10 uh, Ukrainian companies which are seriously considering investment in the Czech Republic. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's really alloca uh, relocation, it's more like expanding their business because they keep their, their teams in Ukraine. And uh, it's very surprising the, to see the uh, type of companies because they, they are very innovative. Uh, coming from industries like gaming, uh, healthcare, engineering. So uh, we try to help them to get the right partners, uh, to connect to universities and uh, introduce to the community. Um, then we also uh, support not only large uh, Ukrainian businesses, but also small ones. We accepted around over 300,000 people coming from Ukraine, and some of them uh, had small businesses in Ukraine, which they want to continue. So we try to also support them with some legal, f uh, explaining the legal framework in the Czech Republic, uh, help them to start a business and also uh, connect to local community in different regions. And as I already mentioned, we are uh, also looking at startups. And Czech Invest is part of European Startup Network, uh, which is about to launch a new program to support Ukrainian startups, uh, where every startup can get 60,000 euro for the start, and also many uh, supporting, uh, many business support from mentors. And Czech Republic would be uh, would like to be part of it and involve the Ukrainian startups in our in, in our incubation programs. Uh, when we talk about the inbound outbound investments, uh, we really see enormous interest among Czech companies. Uh, we created uh, Business Club Ukraine, 
And we already now have around 150 uh, in interested companies uh, interested in exporting, but also investing in Ukraine, not only waiting for uh, when the war is over, but uh, really working on the business plans and on some connections already now. So I think it will be really interesting to see uh, what the future brings, but uh, I'm sure that the, the, the business and investments will be way stronger in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. And already what I hear are three, well, more than three, but three main main aspects. The first aspect is, um, as many countries aim for multinational companies, large companies, maybe 90% of the business in foreign direct investment is small and medium-sized enterprises. They keep the machines running and they keep also the economy running. And this is our main businesses. Um, you do this at Check Invest. You're, pro you're probably everyone does it here on the panel. You, you just uh, named it. On the one hand, on the, the other hand is um, that you already highlighted the importance of green economy. Green economy is probably something which we will, which everyone has to adopt um, in in their in their economies. But now there's the opportunity to build stronger bonds in developing green economy, especially when building up Ukraine. And the third thing is. Um, I think you did already what was mentioned earlier on the panels today, um, to get into business now, um, to build FDI relations now, to have a good platform to um, to build upon that in the future. So thank you, Eva, for that. Um, what kind of FDI um, bonds are there between Estonia and, uh, and Ukraine, Sven? Uh, I think in my opening words, I already mentioned the digital uh, digital side, the digital sector. If we go a little bit deeper, then uh, when I look at my notes, that uh, that what this has already been done and is on place is a digital signature platform, electronic court system, uh, different registries. These are already working. Uh, on top of that, we are also working very heavily with the education, digitalization of education, because the children can't have a proper school education in current uh, conditions. And uh, I, we learned that when I was preparing that there has been already in educational side, 15 technical platforms that translated to Ukrainian language. So we didn't just copy paste it, everything, but we adapted it to Ukrainian children needs. So that is the digital side and that will definitely continue. And in here, we definitely would like to cooperate with other countries who can provide such services which are suitable for Ukrainian environment. Uh, on the other side, we have a long-term relationship with Ukrainians on the construction side. And, and because Estonia is actually known in uh, Europe as one of the biggest modular and uh, element and prefabricated houses producer out of wood, there are, I spoke to somebody already here in, in the audience who is dealing with the, also the uh, polyurethane-based uh, modular houses. We are doing it on a very sustainable way of the wood. Uh, we are one of the biggest suppliers in, uh, in Europe, and uh, there are, it is the first project. It was already mentioned by my colleagues already, is the kindergarten. But uh, the opportunities of this and what this was already mentioned, it's the fastest way that with this type of housing and uh, um, municipal building, we can build up the things within weeks. We can put up some schools, some hospitals, some uh, official buildings, and of course the buildings for people who have lost their homes. So it, we just need uh, basically some kind of foundation, and we either ship it over, there are a whole, uh, it was also mentioned that our business delegation already has been in Ukraine checking out the possibilities to actually set up the production facilities in Ukraine, not just to ship it over from Estonia, but start producing something locally in the Zhitomir area, which is our home oblast in, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. So that's, that's the uh, third thing we are currently working with in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Um, I understand that already what you just mentioned goes ways beyond traditional uh, traditional work of an investment or trade promotion agency. You're dealing with subjects which are closer connected to uh, to the economy by promoting, for example, these housing uh, these housing projects. Yeah, we are working very closely together with our Minister of Foreign Affairs and the ESTEV organization, which Katri Masik is representing. So the, the, we have agreed in Estonia that there is a single contact point is actually there and we are supporting them with the help from the business and actual uh, 
company side. So whenever they have an, a, a reached an agreement on the political and municipal level, whatever there is, we can come in and then just put it put it into implementation very quickly. Makes sense. Thank you, Kiran. What is your opinion on that? On the FTIs? The microphone has to travel back. <laughs> there we go. Thanks for the question, Akam. So firstly, I should say that we in IDA Ireland would be happy and honoured to partner with Ukraine Invest to support their contribution to the reconstruction of their country in any way we can. And we look forward to the time when we will both be actively engaged uh, in that project. As I said in my opening remarks, there are very few economic and trade ties between Ukraine and Ireland at the moment, and equally few foreign direct investment ties. We haven't seen any corporate relocations from Ukraine to Ireland, and that's actually a good thing. Um, we would prefer if Ukrainian firms relocated within Ukraine or to the nearby neighborhood, neighboring countries. Some of our clients that have relocated have actually relocated from Ukraine to, say, Poland or nearby, which is good because it raises the prospects for those companies to return to Ukraine after the conflict. When I think about maybe sectors or activities of foreign direct investment that we have some exposure to that we believe that could play a role in helping to reconstruct Ukraine, in the not too distant future. Um, I think about technology as one sector, one activity, in part because while they're not multinational firms and they're not in our portfolio, there are at least 100 small and medium-sized Irish-owned companies that before the conflict had remote ICT teams doing software development work for them to help their business, but based in Ukraine. That's a very, very significant uh, development. Understandably, those remote teams now um, are no longer present, but the intention of those Irish companies would be to reactivate those remote technical teams when the conflict ends. Ukraine is highly valued for the quality of its graduates, of its people, and of its technical talent. I think uh, other subsectors would be cybersecurity, data and analytics, sensors, and everything to do with defense and security. We are already seeing expanding order books in the defense and security sector and various subsectors, and that will be a growth area in the future as well. So whether you look at it at a, at a sectoral or subsectoral or activity level, there are numerous channels through which Ukraine um, can capture foreign direct investment in the future and leverage that investment to help rebuild the nation. Thanks. Uh, thanks. What's particularly fascinating listening is that you already have a matrix where you can connect products and services in cooperation with Ukraine, which is practically an excellent basis for, for building up business now and later on. Um, Ms. Iveta Strupkaya, Deputy Director, Charter of Export Investment Development Agency, Latvia, could you, um, could you give us your opinion about FDI connections between your country and Ukraine? Uh, yes, um, I think that Latvia's story will be very similar to uh, Estonia's. And uh, of course, Ukraine has been an important and long standing uh, partner for Latvia. And uh, our ties um, have become even stronger in recent years. And if we are talking about investment, over the previous years, investment gradually increased both ways. Actually, um, the Cumulative FDI is is not measurable in billion euros, but uh, the tendency is, is increasing. And of course, we concentrate mostly on sectors which I already mentioned, including ICT. And uh, even before uh, war started, we worked with uh, several projects in ICT sector and also in other sectors. And of course, we, we understand very well that we can offer good conditions and uh, services, incentives for relocation. But we understand very well that these companies, they are ready to relocate for exact time period and not forever because all the efforts will be needed to uh, to rebuild the economy of uh, Ukraine. And um, yeah, as to trade, Ukraine is also an important trade partner for Latvia. 
and uh, during uh, during this time period uh, we um, we cooperate with uh, with uh, ukraine in different sectors including education including uh, including healthcare uh, for example our specialists from rehabilitation center have started an online course for ukraine medical personnel on rehabilitation practices and uh, yeah talking about uh, investment in ukraine there is an initiative from latvian company to share experience and invest in projects which involve the use of peat uh, in energy production in ukraine and also there is interest in developing production production sites uh, for producing modular houses uh, a colleague from estonia also mentioned this but actually we have really really high competence in this sector in in, in latvia and also in estonia uh, yeah what else <laughs> Uh, of course, we, we uh, Latvia welcome Ukrainian business by offering its friendly startup ecosystem and environment and cooperation with academia, uh, with uh, innovative companies. And uh, as to investment projects, uh, we apply a so-called fast track um, approach to every project that uh, that uh, comes from Ukraine. And uh, we started with discussion about uh, transport and logistics. And yeah, if I may, I would I would add uh, one more uh, more comment or maybe a case. Um, there have been discussion and specific proposals to use EU funding to connect. Uh, Ukraine to Rail Baltic through Lviv and Warsaw, which would connect it further to Scandinavia in the north. And I think that for economic cooperation and closer integration, this might be a great uh, project. It is indeed. Um, now, even if we mention digitalization twice or three times, if we mention housing three times, four times, this is an advantage here. Um, the redundancy is our friend because the more we can offer, the more cooperation dots we have, uh, the better it is for um, for helping help the Ukraine in the end. Next would be Mr. Bogdanov, may I ask, to give your statement. Of course, before giving you some practical examples from the last months uh, with Ukrainian companies, uh, uh, we need to discuss how FDI actually works. Uh, in, in general, you need stability. So one of the first aspects we are focusing on a government level is how we can secure stability in terms of financial stability, political, etc. So from a financial point of view, that was one of the key focuses in the moment because um, expenses of the government are huge. Uh, we need to cover different gaps in, in just in few months. And uh, although there were a lot of uh, subsidies to the companies uh, that are operating in Bulgaria, there were a lot of uh, money that has been spent for the people. And at the same time, we managed to be the second lowest uh, in terms of debt to GDP ratio in Europe, in European Union. Um, at the same time, we said, okay, uh, those companies to operate, they need financing. So up to 2027, we managed to secure roughly 15 billion euros, which will be dedicated to different projects, including startups. Um, and uh, also redundancy of our electricity system was another topic. How we can secure the electricity supply once we see that there is a huge issue that we had with the gas. Uh, luckily, we managed to um, have alternative source of the gas now, and one third of our gas is secured. Um, but at the same time, we will develop a critical infrastructure in Bulgaria in terms of energy storage system. So it will be 6,000 megawatt hours. It's a huge amount of energy storage, which will be developed in the next three years. And also, we had even discussion with the uh, Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce, how we can use our seaports in Burgas and Varna, actually, to support in terms of logistics. Um, one of the latest uh, announcements that we made uh, during the Three Seas Initiative in Riga uh, not long time ago was that actually Burgas port will be expanded with the new terminal uh, for containers. And all of these measures are actually packing the initiatives of the government to support and to have sustainable um, FDI in the country regardless from where it comes from or regardless if the company would like to expand in Bulgaria. And then how that applies to the Ukrainian companies or people um, that are um, forced to, to be relocated uh, out of their country. And we started receiving requests from different Ukrainian companies and actually, especially in the IT sector, 
we've been very tightly connected. Um, uh, the Bulgarian uh, IT ecosystem has been working a lot with Ukrainian IT ecosystem. And uh, naturally, after this conflict started, um, those partners that have been working uh, for, for years together, uh, some of them, they, 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 they came to Bulgaria. But even when we received the first inquiries from those companies to relocate, some of them, they had more than 1,000 people, uh, to relocate them in Bulgaria, um, we a little bit broader our perspective because it's not just the company, it's not just the FDI, it's not just the money, it's the people that stand behind. And we said, okay, if we have 1,000 people coming in, we did uh, the analysis together with the company to see how many of them are kids, how, how, how old are they, what they need, what kind of social security they need, um, how their parents can get access to the labor market in Bulgaria. We did that analysis, and just to give you an example, from initially a procedure that takes several months for you to get a permission to work in Bulgaria, uh, for Ukrainian uh, citizen, we, ma we made that, um, r right now it's one week, to get a permission to work. On the other aspect, we said, okay, but let's think about the children. And do you know that there is a different vaccination procedures in Ukraine and in Bulgaria? I don't know how it's in the other European countries, but by law, Ukrainian uh, children were not allowed to go to the Bulgarian schools because actually they don't have the same vaccination. And we said, okay, let's think about the ways how we can actually overcome that. And that was a solution that was implemented. On another hand, um, those Ukrainian companies, again, a big part of them uh, are in the IT sector, but also we have some service companies that originally had their offices in Bulgaria and, and in Ukraine. Um, they actually managed to um, uh, sustain their business, expanding their Bulgarian offices and being able to continue their business as normal, as normal as it could be in that situation. And um, what else we did proactively, we said, let's contact with the um, Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and we organized a round table for the Ukrainian companies, some of them that were in Bulgaria, but some of them, they were, um, um, they were still not relocated or they were looking for different solutions. So we organized a round table uh, that uh, gathered people from different institutions in Bulgaria. So it was very informative what and how we can do it together. And the last step uh, that uh, we undertake um, having these IT partnerships that were established and running before, we said now what we can do for these companies, for those projects to get sustainable and to continue with their innovations, because actually we are talking about innovations here. Um, this was not um, announced yet, but uh, what we are doing at the moment, together with our ecosystem, with the Bulgarian uh, FinTech cluster, uh, and the Invest Bulgarian Agency will be coordinator of this project. We are raising 20 million euros, which will be dedicated to uh, mixed partnerships between Ukrainian and Bulgarian companies, or Ukrainian companies that are now uh, operating in Bulgaria, doing research and development. And this um, uh, should be secured also part of it through European financing, part of it through uh, national financing. We really want to act as partners here. And we are really looking um, into long term how we can support. But again, it's not just the companies. It's the people that need also to be supported. And um, in, the, in the future, of course, hopefully that we went soon, that situation with the war, we went soon. We are also looking further how we can support of maybe relocating back that companies to Ukraine, but also trying to help um, Bulgarian ecosystem be part of the future um, reconstruction of the country and be part to operate um, locally even in, in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I understood that um, one aspect of your of your support is also, to, of course, to help Ukrainian companies in Bulgaria on the one hand, but also to help them to go back to Ukraine. And I think this is a very important factor in the whole in the whole picture. That on the one hand, um, we can support Ukrainian companies by giving them the market, by helping them entering the local market, and thus stabilizing the companies and stabilizing the economy in Ukraine. And on the other hand, um, giving them also the opportunity to go back since they will be strong enough to explore their own market again and maybe also other markets. Um, I would like to, um, to go to Sergey um, again. Hopefully you can hear us. I'll just gonna continue to talk, um, taking into account that there is a delay until the sound reaches you. 
Um, I would be interested in, in, I don't know if it's a good question, but it would be interested in your wish list. What would you wish these investment and trade promotion agencies present here? What do you wish them to emphasize on in their work when it comes to cooperation with Ukraine? So investment insurance 
it's a very big topic. But analytics and thinking through about joint agendas, how we can integrate, this is what we work. And I'm going to give you a small example before I finish my introduction here and during this uh, discussion. Um, at the beginning of the war, Ukraine already started analyzing uh, who was leaving Russia. More than 1,000 companies, as you know, left Russia. For us, as Ukraine invest, we were mostly interested in companies that stopped investing in banks in Russia. And we had about 300 of those on our list. We are getting, getting in touch with them on a daily basis and proposing Ukraine as a new country to invest their money that were planned to invest in Russia after the war will end. Also, to listen to their concerns, to their wishes in terms of regulatory policy. And I, I have to tell you about success right now. I'd like to thank Irish company, Kingspan Company. It's the global leader in insulation and construction materials. They were the first ones to leave for Russia, and they were the first ones to announce investment in Ukraine. In June 2022, they announced investment of over 200 million euros, and they will build their most technologically advanced facility in Ukraine between 2023 and 2027. Ukraine Invest is supporting them now and providing all possible consultations and uh, you know, all the ground support for this uh, project. So once again, thank you for the country and I'm sure that there will be multiple cases like this. So as IPAs, we have to sit down, think about uh, strong you know, sides of your countries and Ukraine. For example, Ukraine is very famous in terms of agricultural produce. Uh, and you know about difficulties that we have with logistics and more than 20 million tons of grain that are stuck in Ukraine, and this would lead to hunger in African countries and so on. So, and so now this process is being unblocked a bit, but uh, more needs to be changed. So there is a great opportunity to develop agri processing sector within Ukraine. Agri processing sector within Ukraine can consume at least 20 billion dollars by 2025, 2027 alone. Can you imagine in these figures? There is a room for every investor from throughout the world in Ukraine, and once again, Ukraine will be rebuilt on a new level. But in the meantime, we have to start planning now how to do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You already paved the way for my last question um, by looking into the future of Ukraine when Ukraine is in its integrity and peaceful again. And I would like to ask the last question to the participants here in uh, here in, um, on the stage. Um, and I would like to ask to be brief because it's a simple question. How do you envision, when you look into the future, what would be the, your vision of how your country cooperates with Ukraine when things are settled, peaceful, and back to integrity. How would you, what would be your vision in the cooperation with Ukraine? And I see Mr. Bogdanov took the microphone, so now go ahead. <laughs> Give it a shot. Bless you. So if, if I can summarize in one sentence, the, the key point here is togetherness. So if we stay together, as uh, as a regional as a region um, as countries that uh, have a very clear vision on which side should be in terms of economic development in terms of democracy if we all stay together and uh, together try to um, overcome uh, all of these challenges in terms of logistics in terms of security in terms of uh, even um, revocation of people we will succeed together. And uh, there are some really good examples looking back at the history that um, we as Europe can do that. But not only we, we are not alone, and we can clearly see that a big part of the world actually is, uh, is on this side. So let's, let's stay together, work together for a better future of Europe. Thank you so much. Um, I think you can pass it over to Iveta or to yeah. Eva. Yeah. What's the perspective of the Czech Republic? 
I will be brief as well. I think um, that together with Ukraine, we will build stronger Europe that Ukraine will very much be involved in all the value chains and supply chains which we have in the region. Uh, we, our companies talking about uh, Russia and how they cut the operations there, I know that our companies are looking uh, to Ukraine as the new, uh, new place for moving the operations which they had in Russia and they will place them in Ukraine to serve the region. So I only see that really it will all make us stronger and that the cooperation will be great. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, I will take it over here. Of course, we definitely welcome Ukraine to the family of EU members and everybody else looking west strongly, which saved our places when we uh, broke up from the Soviet Union. And at the same time, the cooperation was already mentioned is uh, definitely key. Yet, if we, for example, I li really like the idea, and it was uh, in, in the previous uh, panel here that we should find the uh, area uh, either for sectorally based or regionally based where we work. But there are certain things, for example, housing. You can build it every single region or oblast separately without being dependent on each other. But if you look at the digital infrastructure, educational systems, we can't just work in one region doing, we are doing education in here or e-governance here. It has to be countrywide. And that's, well, that's why the cooperation between all our countries who are helping Ukraine to rebuild the country must cooperate very closely. And of course, there, somebody should be the leader who will hold the flag and uh, show the direction. But uh, that the cooperation is the different keyword. Excellent. Thank you. Iveta. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think that we all share common vision and we see Ukraine as a blooming and democratic country. And of course, our economic uh, uh, cooperation is, is close and it will be even closer uh, after. And uh, yeah, I think that together we are, we are stronger than, than being alone. <laughs> And of course, we, we welcome Ukraine and European Union and family of European Union. And yeah, I, I'm looking toward good cooperation. Oh, probably two things that uh, we will have to um, uh, focus after this war. The first uh, one I already mentioned, so the logistic. After the war, the, uh, the world is going to be absolutely different. So the commercial streams from east, they're going to move to the west. West and, of course, uh, uh, Moldova and Ukraine has to go together in this perspective. And the second one, uh, the second one is their phrased Transnistrian conflict. That is a territory controlled by Russia, the states between Ukraine and Moldova. And that is absolutely not good. Uh, any any conflict, even a freeze one, for any uh, international investments. Thank you. So um, our vision would be for Ukraine not only to be a host country for foreign investment, but to become a home, uh, a home for European multinational companies to incubate and originate those firms, and for those firms in turn to invest in their neighbours and other member states across the EU so that there's a mutuality and a reciprocity to the investment flows, us to Ukraine and Ukraine back to us. That will be a foundation for more pan-European peace and prosperity. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what we heard in the discussion right here is that uh, in the beginning we were talking about the foreign direct investments and how far they um, they have uh, challenges these days and what kind of industries they are. And in the in the end, um, we I, I learned when I learned that uh, the industries we heard in the beginning they are also the vision for the future, how to build stronger bonds with Ukraine and to strengthen the Ukraine in the end. With this, I would like to thank particularly Sergei Tivkac for making it possible to stay for such a long time in this discussion. It's really, a great, it's really great to see you and to have your contribution here. And I would also thank this uh, esteemed panel and the panelists um, for having this bright and insightful discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Achim, and thank you very much, valuable speakers. We'll be going on uh, to the next panel, but um, um, maybe a lot of applause for this valuable panel once again. So before we go on to the next section, I want to, um, I have an announcement to make. The International Trade Council and the Estonian Business and Innovation Agency would like to announce that the 2002 Go 2022 Go Global Awards entries will be held in Tallinn, Estonia this year. Finalist judging will take place on the 19th and 20th of October, with the final awards being given at a gala event on the 21st of October. The Estonian Business and Innovation Agency was last year's overall winner amongst trade and investment promotion agencies. However, due to the COVID lockdowns, they did not receive their award in person. So uh, while we are saying goodbye to some of our speakers, I will kindly ask um, some of our speakers, uh, especially for the beginning, uh, for this last year's award. Uh, I want to first call Mr. Sinan Bedir, a board member of the International Trade Council, to come to the stage and present last year's award in person to Mr. Sven Oleg, who will accept the award on behalf of Estonia. Maybe, Mr. Swan, oh, like you want to say a few words? Yes. Yes, thank you once again. Uh, yes, of course, you are all welcome to Tallinn uh, in October, as was mentioned already. The registration is actually already open since today. If you go to glowglobalawards.com, then you will uh, be able to register. All the information is already there. I think uh, with the registration, you already received a little bit, a little cards where you can find this. All this in, uh, most important information bits and pieces. Also in the downstairs, when the registration area is. There is a little stand where uh, I brought together some materials about Estonia, some Estonian candy. So you can have a first taste of what the Tallinn tastes like, because uh, Tallinn is actually on top of being most digital and etc. etc. It is now on a Michelin list of countries. We have a few Michelin star restaurants, around 20 Michelin recommendation restaurants, so you will have a culinary experience as well on top of the business experience. So welcome to Tallinn, October 19, 2021, uh, 1st of October this year already. And we can continue all the conversation with my dear panelists in Tallinn to see how is the situation by that far, how many FDI has been transferred to Ukraine, from Ukraine, etc., etc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a short video. Is the
We still have some awards. The ITC would also like to present an award of recognition to our moderator for today's panel discussion, Mr. Rahim Hartig, Managing Director of Germany Trade and Invest and CEO of the OECD Network of Investment Promotion Agencies in recognition for his hard work and dedication in international investment, promotion, cooperation and innovation through difficult times over these past few years. Thank you very much. Great pleasure, great honor. You're welcome. Sure. <laughs> Sure. I think we cannot overrate um, we cannot overrate the the meaning of foreign direct investments in these days, and um, when these kind of conferences are normally held in in larger cities, and we are like I said before talking about multinational companies um, changing their locations and recreating whole areas of industries, it is often forgotten that uh, what really counts in the in the foreign direct investment business is that what small and medium sized companies do, and when we are involved in helping these kind of companies to uh, to establish locations. We create bonds, we create links between countries. And it's a particular pleasure for me and my team to help this conference um, with the panel moderation and also by helping this conference to, um, to help creating the exchange between the panelists and between the countries and hopefully adding our small two, three millimeters of support uh, to the situation in Ukraine. Thank you very much for your interest and also for your participation. And then I would also like to. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Sorry. And then the ITC would further like to present awards to the Honorable Alina Yanchenko, Secretary of the National Investment Council of Ukraine and Member of Parliament of Ukraine. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for an opportunity to be here to talk to our great audience, to also bring some maybe practical uh, results to our Ukrainian investors, to Turkish investors, to everyone who came here to, to discuss this important uh, topic. You know, uh, today um, the, uh, Ukraine is, associati is associated with bravery. Even in like New York metro stations, it says Ukraine bravery. But I want to say that the real bravery comes from um, average people in Ukraine, but also from not average investors that still work in Ukraine, that uh, show their creativity, flexibility, that show their bravery. So actually, I think all the honors that all the, I don't know, recognitions that uh, organizers of, of this event can give should, give should actually go to Ukrainian investors. So I really ask you to give a round of applause to them. Thank you. Thank you once again, Ms. Alina Yanchenko. And now the Honorable Dimitri Nataluha, Chairman of the Economic Affairs Parliamentary Committee and a Member of Parliament of Ukraine. Could you kindly come to stage? Thank you, and uh, it's a true honor and a true pleasure. Thank the beautiful panelists, the, the Turkish hosts, Alina, Hanadi, and uh, everyone, Eliza, everyone else. Um, I what to say? Um, I think that the situation in Ukraine has clearly demonstrated one simple thing: uh, sanctions are targeting the economy. The economy is being made by business. Business is crucial. To any economy. And if you think that there is only one way to win this war through military force, this is not true. Business is as much important as the military, and therefore we need business to be engaged in it in order to bring peace to the whole world and to our region. So thank you very much for doing this. Thank you to all the businesses from all around the world who support Ukraine, and uh, we will prevail. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And the Honorable Yeli Zavita Yasko, Head of Interparliamentary Cooperation, Bilateral and Multilateral Relations Committee on Foreign Affairs and Interparliamentary Cooperation, Member of Parliament of Ukraine. Yeah. Um, today in my speech, I ask you to think about the future, but uh, just one more time. I want uh, you know to tell to all of you that my life, as the life of many Ukrainians, has never been easy uh, because we have to fight for very existential questions, like for justice, for life tomorrow. And um, that makes us so much stronger. And you cannot imagine how many people were approaching me in the beginning of the war before, and my colleagues and President Zelensky saying, come on, just leave. Leave, let's put the government in exile. Let's, let's not fight uh, against this aggression. But we said, all of us, we said, no, we want to defend ourselves, we want to defend our land, we want to defend our future because it's our land, it's our future, and it's our choice. It's not easy, but I'm sure that in the end this is the right thing because we are true to ourselves and being true to our hearts is not always easy, but it's the only thing that can make us happy and that can really change the world. Let's do that together with a real heart and with things what we feel and the values we care, with the responsible businesses and with making a change for the future because the world is different right now and it will be different even more. Thank you. Hope everything, hope everything good with you. Thank you. We have two more awards to give and for the National Investment Council of Ukraine I would kindly ask again Halina Yenchenko to come on stage. Yeah, another one. Collect the old prizes. Okay. Uh, well, actually, can we actually give it to, to Ukrainian investors finally to give them kudos and to give them applause? Because really, they they deserve it. And um, actually, uh, one of our next panel will be about uh, Ukrainian leaders, Ukrainian um, economic leaders, and I think that that panel will be very uh, interesting. And I really encourage you to stay here and oh, to come back at five and uh, also to some panel discussion before, but at five we will have a very interesting panel discussion with Ukrainian business leaders. They will share their experience, like what was the experience to keep their businesses during the full-scale invasion, how they relocated it, or how they diverse, diversified uh, the uh, production, how they deal with logistics, and once again, how foreign companies or foreign partners can engage in these activities, how they can benefit in these activities, what new partnership or new some agreements and contracts can be signed. So I really encourage you to stay here and or to come back at five and to uh, to get this very useful contacts. And then we have the last award, that is for Mr. Sergei Sivkac, uh, Chief Executive Officer at Ukrainian Waste. I don't know uh, how we will be do that yeah. or, or online, if anybody can take over, or we can maybe present it for the public. Yes, maybe yes. we can do this. Thank so, thank you very much. Thank you very much, our uh, speakers. Thank you very much, Mr. Bogdan Bogdano, Ms. Iveta Strukaya, Ms. Eva Jungmanova. Mr. Stelian Manik, Mr. Kiran Donoyu, and Mr. Saji Sivkac, and Mr. Sven Olik. Thank you very much. And of course, Mr. Ahim Hartig for the great moderation. Thank you. Thank you.
Actually, we had a short break, but I don't think we will be able to have it because we're a bit back on schedule. So I would kindly ask you to stay in your seats. We have a short uh, panel coming up. Invest in Ukraine, a presentation on Ukraine's most important upcoming infrastructure opportunities and how international partners can contribute towards the rebuilding of a new Ukraine and the shared future of economic prosperity. For our speakers, I would kindly call the co-founder of HT Group, UParks Ukraine, Boris Shestopalo. And for Adventure Group Ukraine, the founder, Mr. Andrei Ligak. Hello, welcome. So I will pass the microphone on to you and hello. Yes. It's work or not? How is work? It's work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, who is give time for our small presentations. Uh, we talk a little bit about shortly history and about our idea and about our solutions. Um, like you see, what we have uh, before 2024. Before 2024 of uh, February, uh, Ukraine, it's uh, one of the biggest agriculture food supplier in the world. And uh, what we have now, uh, and we finish uh, 2021 with one of the biggest DGP in history of Ukraine, about $200 billion. And uh, export of agriculture products, it's uh, one of the uh, important part in our export. Uh, just a moment. How it's work as a side? I don't know. Huh? Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, what we have now, we have now a problem and uh, we start, we talk about this problem with all presentations since this whole on all another whole when we talk about uh, Ukrainian today. We have a problem with the logistics corridors, we have a problem uh, with all business which is rely with the Ukrainian agriculture products. Uh, around the world, it's more than around 250,000 different business which is uh, rely with Ukrainian agriculture. And uh, we're very close to the global food, um, global food crisis for the global food risk. And if the war in Ukraine persists, we have a very big chance uh, for back to time when the people not enough real bread, real food. Um, but it uh, it's looks like uh, tragic, but um, we have solutions. It's not just one solution. We have a lot of solutions, and uh, all uh, panelists who is have time on this stand today talk about this. But uh, um, our main idea is a new opportunity what is we have now in Ukraine. When we elaborated Ukrainian economic strategy, we found out that most of Ukrainian exports are the raw materials export. It is why we have real problem with the current situation with seaports, because most of our exports are raw materials. And these tons of exports demand sea way how to export it from Ukraine. So we are trying now found out the ideas how to enlarge complexity of Ukrainian economy, how to enlarge value-added uh, products in our export. And one of these ideas is to establish the special net of uh, agricultural, technological, innovative parks in Ukraine. So uh, we started this um, idea several months ago and we hope to have uh, in 2023 at least one industrial park which will be technological which will be very innovative 
which will produce end, end users products, final products for Ukrainian exports and for domestic market. It is why we are now looking for partners, not only investors. Uh, actually, first of all, we need real partners from around the world in order to jointly with them build the most developed cluster of agriculture technologies, food technologies, and future technologies. It is why we, we uh, now uh, uh, choose three locations inside of Ukraine, uh, in, in the regions where, where we can realize these ideas, where, where we can uh, establish um, right logistics, and where we have local partners. And now we are we started um, started to uh, share this idea uh, around the world in order to have partners from the most developed countries from the most developed uh, technologies. Okay, uh, like I said, it's a different park with different uh, technology, different part of Ukraine because it's close to raw material or to the electricity or to the geography or to the logistics way. Uh, it's um, for future, it's um, eco efficiently, it's uh, new, exactly new, exactly new idea. And uh, of course we used, we must have used special rules, special law in Ukraine about industrial park. And thank you to part of parliament, to part who is sitting in this in this hall, who is really work with this uh, with this new new uh, law with new uh, rules. Uh, we have a very good. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dmitry Natalov. Uh, we have a very good tax. Uh, it's exactly zero tax for ten years. And uh, we have very good start positions for the, uh, like we talk in Ukrainian, people very smart, very brave, and uh, really to changing. And we talk, we talk about real modernizations and real transformations uh, agri-food tech business. Uh, because one of the uh, main story it's a uh, uh, increase uh, cost of our products and margin of our products and increase cost of each ton what is we deliver through the border uh, according to problems what we have today. Uh, it's our team, it's our partners. Now uh, list of these partners is bigger and bigger and bigger. And we uh, continue to develop this program. Uh, we start with the first park near the Vinnytsia. It's a Vinnytsia industrial cluster. Just one week ago, we sent the big agreement with the uh, city council of Vinitsa, and uh, today we have agreement with uh, uh, with the Lviv, and we continue to develop this uh, develop this uh, project. Uh, we have all informations; uh, it's all advantages of our idea. In we have QR code with full presentations of agri industrial park in Ukraine, and. Uh, uh, we have a, uh, we have any answer we have any questions please yeah uh, and finally uh, i can add that uh, in reality we are looking for the real partners in order to develop these parks and clusters jointly uh, we are looking for partners from turkey because we know that uh, turkey has the most interesting and innovative technologies in agrotech uh, for example, in Turkish, we, we know a very good, very good sample, very similar to my, very close to my business because one of our business it's a flour mill, flour mill business. You, uh, Turkish has a very good story during 30 years, approximately uh, built one of the biggest flour, uh, flour business in the world. And now, if I remember, Turkish uh, first uh, has the first positions of the export for the flour. Uh, it means um, we look looking not just investment, we look looking partner and we're looking new residents who is uh, really, really uh, um, try with us start to make it project. Project needs to make it now 
and start to build up the situations in Ukraine with the war more stability. And for global food security. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Boris Chesapalo and Mr. Andrei Digak. Thank you. We have the presentation. So I want to hereby continue with the next panel. Uh, I want to call our moderator, Mr. Denis Yachin. So this is going to be about U.S.-Ukraine business relations. It will be a panel discussion on U.S.-Ukraine business relations, current and potential projects and synergy between the U.S. and Ukraine businesses. The United States attaches great importance to the success of Ukraine as a free and democratic state with a flourishing market economy. U.S. policy is centered on supporting Ukraine in the face of continued Russian aggression as it advances reforms to strengthen the democratic institutions, fight corruption, and promote conditions for economic growth and competition. The panel is dedicated to infrastructure, agriculture, and logistics. And our speakers are going to be Tom Austin from Ukraine Special Projects, uh, sorry, Tom Austin from Trimble. He's the Ukraine Special Projects Director. And from WebTech Corporation, Managing Director of Sales and Project Finance, International Government Affairs, Lars Hickey, and from VP Business Development, USCO Group USA, Vasily Borowski. Welcome, and I think you have the microphone, so you yeah. can proceed with the panel. Thank you. Okay. Check works, works. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I can finally say uh, that this is the panel that you all have been waiting for today. Because we have a very ordinary and extraordinary gentleman here on the arena today. We have reps from American companies that done a lot for Ukraine, that are doing a lot for Ukraine, and I'm sure they will be doing a lot in the future. First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to each of the gentlemen sitting here, to Lars Hickey, to Tom, to Vasily, to Vlad for their uh, support that they have been providing from their companies, from their moral support, financial support, and all, all the job they, uh, they are doing to, to support Ukraine's economy, business, and uh, agriculture, infrastructure, cutting-edge technologies, and other stuff as well. So, uh, as, already, uh, um, as the MC already presented my speakers, I just would like to say a few words about the companies we are having here on the arena today. So we have Tom Austin, Ukraine Special Project Director, Trimble. This is, yeah, also, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very, 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 we are very privileged to have here today two companies from Golden State of California and one, and one gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Keystone State, yeah? Okay. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, but for the pre-production, okay. So the company Trimble, uh, it's a California-based software, hardware, and service technology company. Trimble supports global industrial uh, industries in building, construction, agricultural, uh, natural resources, and utilities, government transportation, and etc. So on the right, we have Lars Hickey, Managing Director of for Sales and Project Finance International Government Affairs, Vapte Corporation. So Vapte Corporation manufactures products for locomotives, freight, freight cars, and passengers' transit vehicles, and builds new locomotives up to 6,000 horsepower. Correct? Okay, super. And on the right to Lars, we have uh, Vasily Borovsky, Vice President Business Development at Yusko Group. Yusko Group is the logistics company in the US, but they also have branches in Europe, uh, and I suppose they are planning to open some branches in uh, elsewhere as well. And on the right to Vasily, we have Vlad Scott, CEO of Ukraine American House and, uh, and uh, CEO of Yusko Express as well. So, Jen, please, a small applaud to all these guys. So, first and foremost, gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time participating in this very important panel. Uh, there are some, there are a lot that has been done today in regards to infrastructure, agricultural, new technologies, uh, develop investing in Ukraine, developing uh, 
Ukrainian infrastructure capabilities and so on. And I think it is time to, to, just, to, just, to, just, to just finalize all these talks that we had today. So um, the first question that I would like to address is to, to you, Tom, if you don't mind, of course. So, Tom, your, your company, your corporation, if I may say, so you're, you are doing a lot of work in, in agriculture, in infrastructure, and all other things as well. What draw your attention to Ukraine? And I know that you have uh, provided uh, substantial support, financial support from, from the company to Ukraine. Just please let us, please let us more about that. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. So um, Trimble is a, um, a NASDAQ traded um, S&P 500 company. Uh, we've got about 12,000 employees around the world. We've got about 40 offices. Um, we were very Russia-centric before. Just naturally, that was the evolution. E even the, you know our Ukraine business was managed through Moscow because that you know European Russia was where the largest market was. Um, so when the war broke out, we changed all of that. We immediately paused our business. Um, we took about two months to um, extricate ourselves. Um, we had about six business units in Russia. Um, now completely out, no assets, no, no business in Russia. At the same time, um, I, I saw a, um, an interview with, with President Zelensky about a month into the war. And he basically said, um, you know, there are companies lined up, lined, lined up out the door to help us later when it's easy. But we're looking for people who are going to help us now. And, and Trimble is the kind of company that, um, you know, we're very interested in um, providing returns for our shareholders, um, but we're also interested in, in doing good. And, and we've got a very strict set of principles that we work on. Um, so recently I became um, Ukraine Special Projects Director, so that will be my full-time job. Um, and I've been told by our leadership that um, it's 50% humanitarian and 50% commercial. Um, so we have precision technology um, for agriculture. Um, we're one of the leading companies in the world that, that make farming more efficient, which in a, a time when there's not enough fuel, there's not enough seed, there's, there's not enough um, uh, other inputs, um, precision farming you know, becomes extra important. Um, we're a world leader in um, geospatial. That's, that's surveying and mapping. And um, one of the Trimble slogans is we bring the digital and the physical worlds together, which is exactly what Ukraine needs right now. Um, as far as um, damage assessment, as far as taking, uh, making 3D models of existing cultural uh, important buildings. So if they do get destroyed, they can be rebuilt. So we're, we're working with, this, with several city administrations to, to do those projects. Um, and then we have construction technology, which also makes the reconstruction process, the planning and the, the execution much more efficient. Okay, great, great. Thank you, Tom. So uh, I would like also to draw the attention of the honorable audience here today that all these uh, gentlemen that are sitting here today here on the arena, they are all connected because some, some one of them are doing a very important work in agriculture, others transport grains, and others uh, just deliver it to the final customer. So, uh, Lars, next question to you. Uh, the, war has, the, the full invasion, the war has changed a lot. How do you see the uh, the railroad transportation change in Ukraine? W any advice from you how it should be rebuilt? Any advice of you how what should Ukrainian government follow in order to have a cutting edge mass railroad infrastructure in upcoming future? No, sure, thank you. Um, we see a immense opportunity in Ukraine. We partner a long time with Ukrzelznica. Um, on the locomotive side of things and also the maintenance and uh, parts facilitation for those locomotives. Um, I think one of the main things for agriculture mining is to have a core fleet of locomotives and rail transportation to be able to export that material uh, in the future. Um, we've seen disruptions in the uh, network, but again, there's a lot of opportunity to upgrade that network uh, from a former Soviet network to more of an American railroad standard, so you can really get the throughput and efficiency that a lot of these companies are looking for. Okay, so do you see more diesel or electric wagons? 
<laughs> well, uh, the biggest thing that we saw as a kind of learning point from this conflict and war was that electric locomotives don't run well when your power grid is disrupted. So what we're seeing is our diesel locomotives and then also our new battery locomotives, autonomous locomotives are key for areas uh, that have you know, possible conflicts. Right now, the freight locomotives that we have are moving uh, about 95% of the humanitarian goods and freight goods in and out of the country. So they're key where if you have a disruption in your power grid, you have to have autonomous uh, transportation, which would lead to a diesel or a battery locomotive. Okay, thank you, Lars. But in regards to just broader area, if I may say so, any changes in, in transportation and logistics in uh, Eastern Europe, if I may say so? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, if you're not familiar with Wabtec, we used to be G Transportation, which is more of a commonly known name uh, throughout the world. Um, but we've sold basically to every CIS country uh, except Russia. And the reason why is Russia has their own locomotive production with RJ Day and Transmesh Holdings, so we're actually competitors. So if you look at the other states, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, those are our locomotives. And the reason why is they've moved away from the Russian standards and the Russian material more towards the Western uh, technology, which now is critical for them because they can procure parts, uh, keep their networks running, where the former Soviet uh, production is, they're no longer able to get parts. Thank you, thank you, Lars. So before we move to Vasily, I would like to ask our honorable panelists to think about three words they are they have association with Ukraine. I will ask these three words at the end of the panel, if you don't mind. Okay, Vasily, so you are working with the, if I may say so, with direct customers. So you are working with Ukraine, you are just uh, transporting uh, grains that, w that uh, thanks to Tom was rising in Ukraine, thanks to Lars was transported out of Ukraine and uh, in the Ukrainian territory. So what, what kind of challenges you faced with? What kind of challenges you are facing now? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, as uh, Dennis introduced us, we're from the USCO transportation group of companies um, with uh, a lot of experience in moving uh, US-based freight as well as international freight. We actually started getting involved with Ukraine uh, through UA House. Our CEO is uh, the chairman of a non-for-profit, uh, which started as soon as the war commenced. It started organizing a lot of uh, charitable uh, donations, uh, equipment, materials, supplies, and I'm sure you'll uh, go into it a little bit more in depth but uh, moving those goods to Ukraine was at the point when we identified just how many challenges there are to get items across the border to get passed through the uh, red tape imposed by certain transit countries and governments <clears throat> of course a lot of work has been done since then to um, ensure that they were removed both by your organization as well the US uh, Business Council has been helping a lot uh, tremendously through their relations and um, uh, we very much appreciate that support. Um, so, so the pain points were mostly uh, discovered at border control checkpoints, uh, lack of storage facilities or the destruction of storage facilities, the uh, inability to source assets within Ukraine itself. So whether it's railroad uh, grain hoppers, it, trucks, uh, because many of the trucks that are usually used to transport grain to major ports, such as Odessa, are actually either being used for the war effort uh, in Ukraine to support the logistics internally uh, to help the military fight off the invasion, or they're being used to collect the current harvest. So where the harvesting is seasonal, uh, it uses a lot of the internal resources for um, you know those particular purposes, like the agricultural operational purposes. So uh, as a logistics and transportation company for us, um, we've been applying a lot of the lessons that we've learned across in the US, uh, which has a very good network of infrastructure, but still suffered during the um, months of September, October, November last year, when we had a major backlog in our ports uh, in the West Coast. Our company was fortunate enough to consult to the uh, United States States National Guard of California and help them uh, create um, policies and, and put them into practices of how to move cargo that was getting uh, backlogged, how it was getting stuck at certain pain points within the port and within the infrastructure system uh, internally. And then we've tried to apply those same uh, principles to move in agricultural products out of Ukraine 
to the border and then onwards to other destinations. Uh, of course, with the major ports of Odessa, Elichovsk, um, and Mykolaiv being uh, currently un inaccessible and unable to shift these vast quantities of agricultural products, you have to get creative, you have to use roadside transits, uh, there are complications and difficulties with that, you have to use the railroad as much as possible, and while there are uh, rail car availabilities, uh, as I'm sure uh, my colleague knows, it's uh, difficult moving it across to Poland because you have to switch over to a different wheelbase um, uh, because Europe uses a completely different rail network system, and there is a shortage of those wheelbases. And uh, there is the utilization of the river network. Uh, this is the River Junai, uh, ports of Reni and Ismail, which are very, very heavily congested right now, trying to move those uh, supplies that are currently accumulating there um, onwards out to Turkey, which has been tremendously uh, helpful in providing storage facilities and onward shipping opportunities to the rest of the world. But it's, it's a very, very small trickle. Uh, we have to open the floodgates more. And uh, there are a number of different you know, solutions and practices where the collaboration and cooperation of maritime, uh, trucking, and railroad companies will be very beneficial to getting uh, the food supplies moving to the rest of the world out of Ukraine. Thank you. And with the help of Trimble and Wabdek, I'm, I'm sure it will be accelerated, if I may say so. OK, Vlad. Question to you. You are one of the cohort of people that moved from Ukraine to USA in 2002? One. 2001. So you established your own business. Um, through all this 21, 20, 21 years, at 22 almost, you have developed, you made a, a great company, if I may say so, yeah? So what drives you still doing business with Ukraine? What kind of opportunities you see as Ukraine American entrepreneur. Uh, sure. Uh, hello, everybody. It's my great honor to be here today. Thank you very much, everybody who attend. Thank you, Dennis, for moderating this panel. And I want to say that uh, business uh, Ukraine American community very much support this type of events. Uh, we had, by the way, coffee with uh, chairman of the U.S. Ukraine Business Council, Morgan William. Uh, Morgan William. He say big hello to everybody. Uh, I live in Sacramento, California for the last 21 years. Um, I say a few words about Ukraine American House. Um, Ukraine American House, that's a non-profit organization, main purpose to promote business relationship between the United States and Ukraine in education, business, and uh, political sectors. One of our successful partners, and that's the American University in Kyiv, uh, which started right before war. Uh, we also, in uh, Sacramento, we have the largest Ukrainian diaspora. Over there, we provide different kind of events. We invite Ukrainian politicians there. Uh, we uh, bring American politicians to Ukraine because we believe uh, when we connect uh, United States, uh, California business uh, politicians with the Ukrainians, they have a great relationship. They have a big experience to exchange, uh, to help each other. Uh, also, uh, American investors, they are always um, interested in Ukraine sectors. So also they um, need um, more transparent um, business structure to be more comfortable and motivated to um, invest in Ukraine. And um, we have to admit, if you're talking about investments, uh, this war in Ukraine is uh, still going. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many professional investors, they're not comfortable uh, start on the investment. And on the other side, we see uh, less help uh, going to Ukraine. And I would encourage uh, private sectors, uh, businesses to unite more to provide help to Ukraine. Uh, thanks to our great uh, partnership with the California National Guard, we were, we were able to send uh, uh, multiple thousands body vest helmets to Ukraine. So I would like to encourage everybody uh, to continue support Ukraine uh, because we're still going there. Uh, back to your question, um, what, what is make us motivated to work with the Ukraine? Um, well, my personal opinion, Ukrainians, there are different people, different even from Russians. Uh, we have our Ukrainian identity. 
when 20 years ago in United States, somebody asked me, where are you from? I said, Ukrainian. Oh, where, oh Russian. Yeah, Russian. So uh, people kind of unite us. But uh, when um, war started in Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian people were able to approve own identity. Uh, our Their um, dedication to their country, their honesty, their uh, resistance, how they... Um, can work hard to protect their country. Uh, we like Ukrainian people. I believe the biggest value to any business, any country, that's the people. And uh, we just love Ukrainian people, and we see a very great and prospective partnership with the Ukrainian people. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, uh, the, the part of what, what Vlad mentioned about the uh, commercial projects and non-commercial projects, I know very well that Trimble is very much in uh, social corporate responsibility. And as you mentioned, 50% is commercial and 50% is not commercial. What kind of opportunities do you see right now in Ukraine in commercial and non-commercial part? Um, so the, the first couple very quick um, projects that we're doing... Um, We've, um, we're working with a uh, demining nonprofit called Halo Trust. So we've given them um, GPS um, equipment to mark mines, to, to, to map out mines. Um, we've got an opportunity to um, work with several city governments to provide 3D scanners to, to, to model culturally important buildings. Um, so all of that's going to be delivered in the next couple of weeks. Um, we've got a larger project going right now uh, together with the U.S. government um, working with the Ukrainian Space Agency on um, some signal corrections forces. Um, we've got a project for supplying road building technology to, because you, without roads, right, you can't transport fuel, you can't transport grain. And railroads. And, and railroads. Um, so, so we've got those types of projects for uh, on the humanitarian side, um, and we, we've got our eyes open for the, the longer term commercial side, um, because we, when our company looks at Ukraine and looks at the Ukrainian people and, and how you have um, um, acted during the, the war, how the, the bravery, the resilience, the creativity, the energy, um, and then we look at the statements that have been made about becoming a modern European country, about rebuilding using the most modern technology, um, then that, that's the kind of project that we want to spend our time on over the next 10 years or so. Okay, Tom, question to you in regards to what uh, President Biden signed, I suppose, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, um, a huge investments in agricultural. Yeah. And additionally, it was announced recently by the USAID a new program on agricultural development in Ukraine. What kind of opportunities is here? Yeah. For, so, for Trimble, of course. Yeah. So, so the USAID, I, I think there are seven different pillars that, that they're working on in Ukraine. Everything from internally displaced persons to, to helping small business and, and helping agriculture. Then separately, they announced a yeah, $100 million agriculture support package yeah, over the past couple of days. Um, so it, it's all um, tied together with first um, food security um, because of the, we've talked about it quite a bit today that the, the long-term effect and the, the very distant effect of, of Ukraine not being able to export food um, is going to be felt in a lot of uh, Middle Eastern and African countries, which is very concerning to the U.S. Um, so when you combine that with you know our, our desire for a very strong, independent, um, capable Ukraine, um, I, I think those are the investments that are being made right now. Okay, thank you, thank you, Lars. Question to you as already uh, the guys the guys right from you mentioned already about that a lot and and Tom as well. So the infrastructure in Ukraine especially the railroad infrastructure, damaged a lot. And a lot of investment will be needed to restore, to improve, to develop, and etc. What kind of, um, may I say, opportunities, role of Waptec, can you tell us about that? Well, I wouldn't say it's necessarily only opportunities for Waptec, but I think uh, Ukrasil's Nisi, again, has an opportunity to rebuild their rail uh, and rebuild it in a way that it's more efficient, uh, using some more American and European standards 
to really make that network more efficient and possibly start over again. Because before they inherited a Soviet network that probably wasn't the most efficient, but now you have the opportunity to more, add more digital projects, products, digitalize it, uh, and get the network to move faster and more efficiently. Lars, when we are talking about the railroad, we all know that uh, the European railroad system is a bit wider than the Ukrainian. Is it a problem to transport grains and all other goods ex Yeah, so the, the, the former Soviet network is Russian gauge, was actually larger than the standard gauge, which is Europe. So there's, you know, the challenge as we talk about logistics, moving across the border, you have a changing station where you're moving uh, rail cars from Russian gauge to uh, standard gauge. So that area there, again, on the Polish border, Romania, Hungary, um, all those borders have uh, changing ports which need to be uh, revamped, made more efficient so we can keep the throughput of the grain and material moving faster. All right. So in regards to moving faster, Lars, what kind of, uh, may I say, lessons have been learned from all this situation? Maybe, what kind of lessons have you learned for yourself and as a managing director of Optic? Well, I, I look at all of uh, Eastern Europe and like I mentioned before, um, it's really now a concern to have autonomous uh, locomotives. And the European standard of electrifying everything doesn't work so well when someone interrupts your power grid. So we're seeing a lot of countries now look at their rail network as more of a sovereign security type of uh, you know, uh, initiative versus just it's nice to have a railroad, um, which also will benefit the grain companies and the mining companies in the country if there's more of a focus on revamping it, modernizing it, and considering it a key asset within the country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Vasily, question to you. So we already discussed about, a lot about the agricultural, the, about the railroad. What can, what else can be done, may I say so, by European states, neighboring European states, Poland, Czechia, probably Bulgaria, as well as the, my fellow co-panelists mentioned uh, on the previous panel, in order to help Ukraine and expand the volumes that Ukraine can export. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the what we are finding right now is a lot of the countries that you mentioned are themselves inherently uh, agriculturally focused countries. So they have their own produce and their own product that they have to uh, harvest, transport, and ship out of the country to end buyers and end users. Um, a lot of their facilities uh, are not uh, capable of handling more volume. So they've only they haven't really future proofed themselves. They they cannot take additional capacity on top of the agricultural products that they have um, in order to to service it and to get it out efficiently and quickly, or to receive more vessels, for example, or trains. Um, so working with other partners, uh, th there are a number of directions where they can be absolutely more helpful. Um, and some of those uh, very much relate to what previous panelists and previous discussions were about. For example, um, Poland, uh, Bulgaria, some of the other further um, uh, countries away from the border of Ukraine have large trucking networks, a lot of transportation and trucking companies, which are right now very much afraid to send their assets to Ukraine because of the military um, situation, the war risk. Insurance doesn't cover their assets in case something goes wrong. Insurance doesn't necessarily cover the freight that they're carrying as well, which could lead to multi-million dollar losses. So it would be beneficial for um, the banking sector and the insurance sector to unite and provide further support, possibly with governmental uh, oversight, uh, whereby um, transits into Ukraine and coming back out of Ukraine with freight would be protected, uh, would be insured, would be underwritten uh, by major players in the field, so that the uh, transportation companies have that sort of security and sense that, hey, we're risking uh, going there to help the country, but it's not going to put us at a standstill in case our assets become somehow immobilized, damaged, destroyed, and so on and so forth. And of course, it goes from trucks to trains that potentially could be sent across from other neighboring countries and bring back goods, but not even necessarily bringing goods out of Ukraine. Ukraine needs a lot of supplies going in as well. Uh, we're talking about humanitarian needs. We're talking about fertilizer, which there is a huge shortage of. Um, so, so the country needs to prepare for farming and harvesting for the next year and the next season, or well, there's going to be a huge shortfall. 
and of course vessels, maritime, uh, you know, the shipping lanes, the ports. Um, most of the river ports in the Danube can receive some sort of barging equipment or uh, sea river type vessels. Uh, we would very much like to see as a logistics transportation company more maritime players becoming involved in this um, particular geographical region and providing access to their vessels, to their barges, to ship Ukrainian goods out of the country and to ship other much needed supplies into Ukraine as well. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, Vlad, question to you. You know, uh, I, remi I remember the, uh, the the words that were said by Winston Churchill, never let the good crisis go to waste. So what kind of opportunities do you see right now in Ukraine? Any new opportunities of doing business with Ukraine? Because the uh, different situation, if I may say so, requires different approach and different businesses as well. Absolutely, I see there is new opportunity in any sectors because we understand that a big portion of Ukraine business was uh, connected uh, to Russia, Belarus in terms of uh, oil purchase, oil transportation and uh, with the history how businesses was built that was more towards like to Soviet Union countries. But now when uh, this invasion happened, uh, Ukraine changing everything. Ukraine purchasing uh, oil from the Europe, uh, Ukraine um, changing everything. There is more and more sanctions imposed into Russia. Uh, so I would say there is any specters uh, in transportation, in IT, in finances. Uh, right now Ukraine rebuilding. That's completely in every sector, and that's great opportunity to prove uh, to the world that Ukrainian Ukrainians, that's a um, new country, country can um, protect themselves and can build business without corruption. Because still many um, professional investors, they're a little bit hesitant, but now they see how Ukrainians protect the, protecting their country. Uh, there is hope and belief that Ukraine open and will rebuild this uh, economic, new economic, economic without corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question, Tom, question, question to you, as you mentioned already, about the high-end technology and so on, you mentioned about the uh, Ukrainian Space Agency. Uh, as we all know that a lot of uh, American companies, especially like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Honeywell, uh, Radiant Technologies, they are all looking into the space. And you mentioned about the space. I suppose 20, 25 years ago, Ukraine was a state with some space special, if I may say so. What kind of opportunities do you see right now in this area? In, in space? Yes. <laughs> we haven't looked um, very closely. Um, Ukraine has always been very famous for uh, aviation products, for, for airplanes, um, some t in machine building. Um, space, I think there's a great opportunity. Um, the one thing that I'd like to, to bring up, you know, if I have the chance, is, is we're looking more and more at training. Um, so not so much space, but IT, for instance. So the, the Minister of, Ministry of Digital Transformation just announced a new project to, to um, increase the amount of GDP through IT, to, to kind of bring it to the level of agriculture. So I think they announced they want to they want to train 40,000 new um, IT specialists, um, which I think is a fantastic thing for the for the future of Ukraine. Um, but uh, also when we think about rebuilding, um, we need to think about training. So Trimble we supply uh, what we call technology labs to, to universities around the world. So so we're in discussions with a couple different uh, institutions in Ukraine about providing Trimble hardware and software for, for students to train on, and that's mapping, surveying, and construction technology, uh, ag agriculture technology. Uh, but also, um, when um, we think about rebuilding, you know, one of our main partners around the world is Caterpillar, and uh, I was on a call with them, and I said, look, you know, that given the uh, supply chain shortages um, and, and the availability of construction machines right now, it's very hard to get any extra machines. 
I said, what, what are your plans? You know, you, you, you need to send like 5,000 machines to Ukraine in the next 18 to 24 months or so. You, know, you mean the heavy machines from Caterpillar? Heavy pillars. construction machines, yeah. And, um, and so that's, they're looking at their strategic plan on, on how to make sure those are ready. But we also agreed on the phone call that the, the worst thing that could happen is to send 5,000 heavy construction machines to Ukraine right now because just like every other high-tech piece of equipment, it needs to be maintained, right? So you, you need a network of thousands of trained technicians and trained operators. You need parts logistics, all of those things. And that all needs to be set up now, well before the, the machine actually arrives. So part of the plan for reconstruction it needs to be training, like vocational training of technicians and operators and surveyors and mappers and architects. And I suppose the inviolable part of every reconstruction is financing, of course. <laughs> it, it, absolutely, but personally, but that, that's lower down on my list because, you know, between the U.S. and the and, you know, European Union has the Solidarity Fund, um, you know, World Bank, IMF, that those are all sources of funds. Um, plus that, you know, we, we hear a lot from the, the legal teams that are working on all of the Russian government and oligarch assets that have been frozen, it's very difficult to use them to confiscate them and just give them to Ukraine. There's no precedent for that. But, but there are teams of very smart people that are working on ways to maybe keep those assets as a, as a um, guarantee uh, while Russia pays Ukraine reparations um, or you know taxes on oil and gas exports, something like that. Um, so, so between world governments and, and international institutions and Russian assets, I think there's going to be money. Thank you. Thank you. Lars, question to you, as Tom already mentioned about the financing. I know you guys helped uh, to use the at the beginning of after the invasion with some uh, spare parts uh, in order to maintain nuclear resilience to operate efficient, efficiently and so on. How do you see right now the, the role of UZ and probably the Minister of Infrastructure in rebuilding all those that were that was damaged? No, we see it as a critical component. As you talked about earlier, um, moving aggregated in and out is going to be critical. Moving heavy machinery in and out is going to be critical. And you're going to have to do that over rail. Um, you know, you're going to have to move it from the seaport. So um, we see UZ as being one of the core components of rebuilding Ukraine. Um, so, I mean, every aspect of it um, needs to be kind of revamped and uh, looked at again and prioritized within the government. Okay, so I, I, I may assume that you're providing them with some key, key devices in order to, to, to make the Ukrainian railroad system uh, like 21st century railroad system, if I may say. Yeah, so again, like the assets that we're providing them um, are state-of-the-art assets. They require less maintenance. They're 50% more fuel efficient, uh, so on and so forth. So again, that that was critical for Ukraine during the last six months is to have assets that don't break down. Uh, we were able to supply them with about $4 million of spare parts uh, just to keep those uh, units running uh, to the border as fast as they could. Thank you. Thank you. Vlad, what is... What do you see right now as the biggest challenge of doing business in Ukraine? Because usually, you know, a lot of investors are com are saying that Ukraine never loses an opportunity to lose an opportunity. But thanks to entrepreneurs like you that are uh, looking forward and just going forward, you are reaching uh, reaching your skies, if I may say so. so. Um. There is too many challenges, as I mentioned before, because war in Ukraine, it's not finished yet. So it's very hard to bring any uh, outside professional businesses. For example, all finances, they block all programs uh, for other Ukrainian businesses. In logistics standpoint, there's uh, impossible to um, send to Ukraine any equipment what you list in the um, European Union because they're on the strict, uh, I know many European partners that are not able to operate in Ukraine. There is 
no flight, no connections. And uh, during the war, uh, I believe Ukraine uh, doing amazing. She, Ukraine surviving, protecting uh, people of Ukraine, protecting country, and still sort of support. So there is um, because of war we have issue in any sector. Thank you a lot. So, Vasily, I suppose the, the, may, maybe the last question. What, what are the, if I may say so, the key challenge for you right now to handle all your orders transporting to and from Ukraine? If I were to point, pinpoint one, it's definitely border crossings. <clears throat> a lot of the border crossings, border crossings yes. Uh, a lot of uh, material supplies are being held up in uh, very large uh, queues uh, uh, crossing borders into Poland, Moldova, uh, and further on. Um, a, a huge assistance, and again, we, we have seen this work very effectively when we were decongesting uh, ports on the west coast of the United States, uh, was to create special customs bonded zones outside of the territory of the port, so essentially huge, large, flat areas of uh, space where cargo could be taken uh, across to and additional personnel could clear it into the country because the port itself only had limited amount of capacity. Same way with the border crossing, in order to avoid these uh, long lines and uh, incredible waiting times uh, to move critical supplies, uh, it could be a very beneficial factor to create landing or staging areas, which are customs bonded. So um, when the trucks are rerouted to fields, essentially, with uh, with personal, uh, you know, gated uh, around them, uh, to, to clear those trucks, that way it creates uh, uh, easier pathways through the road network. It provides a staging area where the trucks can be pre-cleared before they go through the border. It's still a customs uh, bound zone, so any documentational uh, errors or procedures can be resolved in that particular geolocation, which doesn't affect the rest of the infrastructure of, of the freight movement. So uh, if we could have better and clearer efficiency on borders, and that would require the involvement of obviously governmental entities, ministries of customs and trade, and so on and so forth, that could be a very, very major factor in, uh, in clearing up and improving the efficiency of the supply chains. Thank you, thank you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just admire all these all this guys that are sitting right now on, on the panel because I'm, I'm admire their readiness, their willingness, and their uh, energy to do business in Ukraine, to, to, to bring high-end and cutting-edge technologies, to develop railroad system, to make it the the system of the 21st century and of course to find ways how to feed the world with with food and deliver all the necessary goods so and now i suppose we came to the most interesting part gentlemen so our time is almost over so three words that you associate ukraine with vlad um, before three words, um, I'm very well connected with the Ukraine. Uh, my parents in Ukraine, my f uh, five brothers in Ukraine, they refused to relocate, even one of them citizen of the United States. We have office in Kiev, in Odessa. Uh, so uh, I believe in three words I can express what is the most important for them. So it's victory, victory, and victory. Everything else Ukraine will rebuild and he will handle. Number one, number two, number three, victory. Very well said. I will note that. Thank you. Thank you. Vasily. Uh, for me, the three words would probably be compatibility. And that means that Ukraine really needs to start thinking about how its infrastructure and networking and internally uh, infrastructural networks can be compatible with uh, Europe. That's uh, both in the railroad sector, in the... Oh, I can't explain? All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Compatibility. Paragraphs. Compatibility. Projectization. Rebuilding of Ukraine definitely needs to be run as a project because it's so, such a complicated process. An entity needs to be in charge of it. And all the stakeholders, everybody who's present here, needs to be aware of what's going on and how they can plug in to assist further improvement. And the third one is future. You know, this is this is the part where Ukraine is actively looking forward to a better future. And uh, I hope that everybody who is here will help in uh, creating that a realistic possibility. Thank you. Lars? 
So I guess uh, my experience there and former G transportation and uh, Wabtex experience would be resilience, opportunistic, and welcoming. Very well said. Thank you. So, sounds like Pennsylvania motto. <laughs> so so uh, I, I've been studying Ukrainian language. Wow. So, so my three words are Nablujayamo, Pirimoku, Razum. Whoa, this is, the, this is very well said. Thank you. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to be on the panel. Thank you very much for your notes, for your looking forward plans. And let's hope for the best. Let's hope for the upcoming victory. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for our moderator and for our speakers. So, we have a... We have a 10 minute break and at 5 p.m. we'll be here for a business leaders roundtable and we will be having real world views from business leaders who have actually invested in Ukraine. At 5 p.m. see you.
Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, may I please kindly ask you to take your seats. We are ready for the next panel coming up. And this one will be quite interesting. Actually, it will be Business Leaders Roundtable. So we will have real world views from business leaders who have invested in Ukraine. I want to kindly call our speakers, founder and president of CEO Club Ukraine, Mr. Sahi Haidachuk. Founder of Medis, founder of Petri, Vladimir Reshato, CEO and founder of Biosphere Corporation, Andriy Desenko, Studio Park, Chairman of the Board of Directors, Vadim Gurzos, Managing Partner and President of PJSC, Toronto, Kiev, Yuri Kruvyosia, HD Group, U Parks, Ukraine, co founder. Boris Shestopalo, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing the names, hopefully. And for our moderator, I will call honor, honorary, Honorable Olina Yanshenko, member of Ukrainian parliament and secretary of the National Investment Council of Ukraine. And to do the opening speech, I will call Deputy Chairman of the Board of Directors of Doge Holding, Mr. Husnu Akan, but he has a flight to catch, so after his speech, he will be not with us, unfortunately. So first of all, I want to leave the stage to him. Hello, welcome. Sorry. Well, I would like to welcome you all, first of all, to Turkey and to Istanbul, beautiful city of Istanbul. And also I would like to thank to the organizers to set up this forum and invite me to address to the distinguished audience. Uh, if I may, I would like to start to talk about very shortly about Doge Group, who Doge Group is. Doge Group is the third conglomerate of Turkey, uh, third biggest conglomerate of Turkey, and the, the Doge Group was set up in 1951 as the construction company. And since then, we have been active in different areas like the automotive, the tourism, hospitality, retail, media, real estate, construction, and energy sectors. Uh, Deutsche Group has more than 300 companies uh, and with more than 20,000 staffs all over the world in 21 countries with 200 locations. And uh, the uh, end of this year, we're going to have some six and a half billion dollars revenue with the nine million euros EBITDA. Uh, Deutsche Group, in uh, short, the uh, automotive, we are the exclusive distributor of the Volkswagen and Audi cars and also all the branded cars under the Volkswagen uh, umbrella like Seat, Skoda, Porsche, Bentley, Lamborghini and Scania trucks as well. And the hospitality and retail part, uh, we have 13 hotels in Turkey and abroad. And also we have in the FMB business, we have more than 200 restaurants all over the world. So maybe you might know all the uh, famous brands like Zuma, like uh, Roca, Koya, Amazonica, some, and also Nusret like this. And also we have the retail group here in Turkey. We are the exclusive distributor of Laura Piana, Under Armour, and Kiko. 
When I come to the Doge construction, which we have been in uh, existence in Ukraine for the last 18 years, and Doge Group, as I said, was set up as the construction company in 1951, and since then we have completed 250 mega infrastructure and superstructure projects uh, with the value of 28 and a half billion dollars in not only in Turkey but also some other neighboring countries as well. Uh, we are active in the Middle East, North Africa, and the southeastern part of uh, Europe, and we are trying to have some other uh, region to active in the construction areas, not only the uh, just to transfer our expertise and know-how in the infrastructure projects like the tunneling, the uh, seaports, airports, the dam projects, metro projects as such, as such, and also the superstructure projects as well. So far, we have completed more than 1,500 kilometers roads, almost 50 kilometers of bridges and viaducts, and uh, more than over uh, 340 kilometers subways, railways, and tunnels. And also, we have completed 21 dam and hydroelectric power plant projects in Turkey and abroad, and 45 million square meters of the uh, uh, superstructure buildings. And uh, when I look at the Doge construction activities in Ukraine, uh, in the last 18 years, we have completed three major projects in uh, Ukraine. The first one was the Darnitsa Bridge in Kiev on the Dnieper River, and then the project value was $110 million. And it is a railway and highway bridge, as you may know. And it is the six highway lanes and the two railway gorges. The uh, length of the bridge, 1,066 meter, and the width of the bridge was, uh, is 40 million. And the, uh, when we look at the estimated traffic capacity of the, of the bridge, it is 60, 60,000 cars per 24 hours and 120 trains in each direction for 24 hours. And the second project was uh, slightly on scale, small one, Zaporozhye wastewater treatment plant reconstruction, and the project value was $14 million. Uh, the other project which we are proud of is the Borispol International Airport Ter Terminal D, and the project value was $443 million. And it was the airport development project, as I said, and the 100,000 100, square meter terminal building, and also the 200,000 square meter the uh, apron, uh, apron building. And currently, we are constructing a cable state bridge project in Kremenchuk city of Ukraine. Even though the war started, we fully keep our staff for the project and also full missionary park in the Karamanchuk city. We hope the situation is going to get better and also we would like to resume our project as soon as possible. Because Ukraine is a very important country for us, for Doge, and we have existence, as I said, in, in the country for 18 years and we would like to stay more and we are strongly willing to continue our activities uh, after the war as well. And we would like to uh, support in rebuilding the country in the coming years. And normally, I can say that the Ukraine has challenging market conditions for international contractors. Therefore, you may not find a lot of international contractors in the country. But Deutsche Construction Company is the unique contractor, one of the unique contractors who could manage to merge the international contractor standards with the uh, local expertise in Ukraine. Beginning from the 24th of February, we are closely, very closely following the situation in Ukraine. We have very deep 
pain and sorrow about the situation and trying to give all support that we can. We are keeping, first of all, all our staff related with our uh, project. We did not fire any staff of the project, uh, either uh, the Turkish ones or the Ukrainian ones. And uh, we are supporting, we're still supporting the Ukrainian staff and their families. We are hosting wives, kids, and relatives of our Ukrainian staff in our hotels in Turkey. Currently, there are 70 people with us, and we will look after them until the situation gets stable in Ukraine. As we all notice that the impact of the Russian invasion or, and the war affected not only the uh, region, but also all over the world. Energy and commodity prices are getting higher. A lot of governments increasing their military budget, also global food crisis is expected. Even though just the further development, we are expecting that the, some of the European countries, maybe including the USA, is going to experience the recession or stagflation as well. We hope that the stagflation will not be the case for the countries because otherwise we can see some of the countries is going to go deeply the depression in their economies and then it will have another uh, so much impact, negative impact for the, for the other countries as well. Uh, and uh, as uh, just to sum up, I would like to uh, mention about our construction activities once again that the in rebuild, rebuilding or reconstructing projects uh, in Ukraine we would like to be take part of it uh, very actively and then we will continue to support uh, to give our support and help to Ukrainian friends and Ukrainian brothers and also the, well, uh, I hope that the uh, this forum will be much as much productive as uh, it was in the uh, obviously the morning sessions uh, for tomorrow as well and thank you very much for listening to me thank you thank you very much mr fusniakon safe travels so i will hand over the microphone to mr Thank you, Mr. Ahan, especially thanks for your social responsibility and for the fact that you keep all the employees, it's very important. And we are honored to be joined by Andriy Zdesenko, who is the owner of um, Biosphere Corporation. The headquarter is in Dnipro, and, um, and actually, we can actually start our great panel discussion. I was waiting for this panel discussion for the whole day, because over here, we will talk with the true Ukrainian uh, business leaders, I would even say economic elites, but today, I would even say economic heroes of Ukraine. Of uh, All of these great gentlemen are owners or CEO of uh, largest Ukrainian uh, businesses. All of them have started their businesses from the scratch, basically without any specific help from the state or, you know, they did not inherit it. So these are totally self-made men. And I am very happy to be uh, moderating uh, this panel discussion. The final note I want to, uh, to share with you before we actually start is that uh, Ukrainian uh, business community is a very special community. They are very flexible, they are very creative, they are reformers, and in some cases I would say uh, they even do some revolution in very positive meaning of this word. Uh, for example, a lot of uh, our panelists mentioned uh, so-called uh, mobile application, uh, state mobile application, DIA, where Ukrainian can uh, find the electronic passports, electronic COVID certificates, electronic uh, taxi drivers, but not uh, that many people know that this state mobile application was inspired, state was inspired by Ukrainian private sector. Uh, we have uh, a bank called Private Bank, and they had an application called Private24. They made a revolution in Ukrainian banking. They made each client basically a banker for himself. Any client could receive 
any bank uh, service with their mobile application. And we were inspired, we as politicians, before the presidential elections were inspired by that experience of private sector. And we decided that we want to have so-called State 24 or Derzhava 24. And that's how DIA appeared. And so now we definitely, we as state stakeholders, definitely have uh, something to learn from our economic heroes, our economic elite, and I'm very honored to actually pass the floor to this gentleman. And I would uh, like to start this panel discussion with uh, giving a floor to uh, Sergei Gaidachuk. He is a founder of SEO Club, uh, which unites uh, 230 members. They are owners or CEO of the biggest Ukrainian businesses, also some foreign businesses who operate in Ukraine, and they are a true community who are helping each other, exchanging information, who are starting common uh, businesses. So, uh, Sergei, please share some uh, I don't know, experience or impressions of owners of your club as well as how your club is operating. How are you helping each other now in this specific circumstances? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to start uh, by thanking uh, our colleagues uh, for organizing this event, as far as uh, thanking for Turkish people for supporting Ukraine in this difficult time. As Helena mentioned, uh, I represent uh, one of the biggest Ukrainian business communities, uh, consists of uh, leaders. Uh, they are owners and CEOs of different uh, largest and medium-sized companies from different spheres. Since the war started, uh, it uh, was uh, 24th of February, our whole community, uh, they are 230 members, turned into a separate army, I would say. We united our resources, uh, our expertise, our energy, everything what we had into uh, a business army. We divided ourselves uh, into different uh, groups. Uh, each group of our member is responsible for uh, its specific area of work, such as uh, fundraising, logistic, procurement, uh, PR and cyber operations, uh, uh, evacuation support, uh, etc. And we, uh, we have been uh, uh, operating until now. Uh, as a community, we decided and continue to solve hundreds and thousands very important uh, problems and issues supporting our army, our nation, uh, and our civilians. Uh, from the, uh, since the war started, we uh, raised and collected among our members more than 30 million dollars, and all this money was sent for purchasing different equipments for uh, our army. Uh, but uh, what kind of uh, lessons I would like to share with you? What I learned from these uh, uh, difficult times? Uh, so first, uh, all the lessons about people. Uh, first lesson that uh, social capital, trusted network, communities of peers are playing a critical role of surviving in such difficult times. Uh, when a disaster strikes and uh, all state institutions are paralyzed, when rockets and bombs fly, you have no time to, uh, you have no time for anything. You have to survive and save yourself, your loved ones, your teams, and if possible, your uh, businesses. Uh, and uh, our community played a very important role in this surviving because uh, 230 leaders uh, uh, united uh, all the forces into one bank, into one mega brain, I would say, and we supported each other every day, 24 hours per, per day. And uh, we supported our country. Second, uh, what I learned, uh, it's uh, overestimation of people from uh, my social circles. It is only during such uh, tough times, uh, like a war, where death awaits for you at every corner, you can really see who is who. 
who does what and uh, how they behave. Uh, you see through everyone uh, who really has the uh, right values and who is a real leader. Uh, war is the most effective formation uh, training of all that exists. Uh, war provides a unique opportunity to clean up your teams, your social environment, and create the most powerful team. And the uh, third lesson, care and support uh, of others. Care and support of others in such difficult uh, moments lays uh, a great foundation for the future because people, uh, uh, people are the most valuable entity. And uh, if you are, as a leader, in difficult times, demonstrate uh, sincere care for people and show them their importance, uh, they will appreciate it. And it really uh, built a strong foundation of your leadership, of your trust, and uh, foundation for your business for many years to come. People see everything and uh, they will appreciate it. Take care of people uh, in the first place. So everything around people. Because uh, when the crisis, when the catastrophe, you can't take uh, on, you can't uh, uh, you can't get support from institutions, from traditional resources, etc. You just uh, can't on your colleagues, uh, on the relationship you built before. And this is the most uh, important uh, lesson I learned from, from this war. And uh, I have three reasons uh, why, why to invest uh, in Ukraine. And uh, uh, all these uh, reasons uh, uh, are not so uh, concrete things. Uh, it's not uh, projects uh, or different economic data. But precisely, uh, I would like to share about invisible things. Invisible things that created the Ukrainian nation today. And those invisible things are I believe uh, will become uh, uh, the foundation of the future Ukrainian economic development. So why Ukraine will be a very attractive country for investments after the war? First, the huge erased spirit of the Ukrainian nation. This is the enormous energy of the unity and spirit of the entire nation which 100% will be transformed into a powerful fuel and driver for the further rapid development of our economy. Uh, it is difficult to pass um, the level uh, of this energy and this spirit and hope uh, we have today in Ukraine. Second, self-belief. Uh, this is very important, but we started to believe in ourselves as a country, as a nation. And you know that faith is the most powerful driver of any change. Uh, but not less important in the, in the fact that we began to trust each other, including our government. The level of trust in the uh, society increased significantly today. And now we want to prove the whole, uh, to the whole world that Ukraine in business and economy will be able to surprise the world no less than on the battlefield. And third, Ukraine is a great global startup today. The whole world will invest in Ukraine and it will become, become a unique planetary startup that will be able to earn, I would say, hundreds and thousands of percent of profitability in a short period of time. But in order to make such a money when the war is over, you need to start now. Let's be friends, let's form partnership now, and let's create more benefits, not only for ourselves, 
but for the society around us. Let's start now. Thank you. Our next economic super superman will be Andreas Desenko. Uh, how can I present this great guy? Probably uh, with the fact that they are dominating Ukrainian market in the uh, topic of hygiene products and uh, domestic chemicals, if we can say so, in, in Ukrainian. Hygienic cosmetic goods and household goods, house cleaning goods, but oh. not only in Ukraine. In what a perfect countries. English. Give a round of applause to this gentleman, please. No. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Andriy's company has four uh, factories in Ukraine, and, and that's probably what really helped them to go through this crisis and go through the challenges. But uh, the heart of their production was in Dnipro. So, Andriy, I want to ask you a question. What were your strategies? Uh, how did you make this crisis uh, management? And probably um, give some lessons learned. I guess we all have a lot uh, to learn from, from your experience, because if you could survive through those challenges that you faced, you can probably survive through anything. And you can probably build any kind of business in any country in the world. So please share your experience, crisis management, and maybe some recommendations whether you would advise to invest in Ukraine or not. If so, when and what sectors and stuff like that. Please, the floor is yours. Kalina, thank you. Thank you, audience, for the support and the very positive uh, vibes and smiles and energy because uh, for Ukrainians it's very important not only you know tangible support it's the, also the human support it's very important and it's really in big inspiration for everybody in this stage um, frankly speaking this crisis this war this, this the horrible time is not the first time which we you know challenging us uh, before it was two years of uh, of COVID time and uh, it was the big challenge for us but it challenge uh, give us the strength and the ability you know to to protect the uh, the, the crisis and to be effective even in very in a difficult time and uh, what is the, the big challenge now for the for the production for the producers for the industry in Ukraine and I can say that uh, all our production all, all our full production in Ukraine even in Dnipro when we have the biggest hub the biggest cluster production cluster is working 24 hours just we have a make a break if uh, the the rockets alarm and uh, you know this uh, uh, this this expectation of of the dangerous situation, and when the, when the people that all employees need to go to the bomb shelters, of course, it's the make the the big influence of the efficiency. But despite of that, we are able to produce uh, quality product and deliver the whole territory in Ukraine. And uh, the, also we have the, our recycling plant and the second plant in the Western Ukraine. And what we do now, we split our factories uh, to decrease the risk. It you know, takes a lot of investment. And uh, also the question of the people, of their readiness to, to move to other, other cities in Ukraine, to stay there with the families. And uh, also we have a big challenge because the, the many of our employees now stay abroad of Ukraine. But we have a very strong uh, bridge, professional bridge, and with the steel one company. Uh, before the war, we sell like uh, more than one million goods every day in the 30 countries. And now what we see that we are still effective because we have a modern investment and we have uh, the good facilities, uh, you know, to be competitive and to sell uh, this product uh, abroad of Ukraine. And like uh, the potential uh, partner, I completely agree with uh, Sergei that now is there really risk to invest in Ukraine for new facilities because, you know, it's the question of investment, of the financing, how to find the right people. But it's the good time for you to find in Ukraine in the good partner, the good industry, because when the world finished when we will win 
you know, I'm sure that our industry and our consumption, the people will come, the customer will come, will be grow very, very fast. And to be in the same time in, 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 in the future together with the strong companies, with this leader of industry, to understand now what kind of industry we will develop and grow and will be more profitable and attractive, it's, you know, it's the time to discuss right now, not, no, not to postpone this investment, not postpone the future, not postpone you know, the, uh, the, this, this important, important project. Uh, that's why what we do right now, we are, we, are, we are working. We would like to be efficient. It's you know we we, we now do many revolution, not outside the company, inside the company. We change the structure. We uh, we do many many changes. Uh, we move the equipment uh, to the Western Ukraine, and, and also we would like you know to bring some some investment abroad to Ukraine to be more effective, but. We are, we are looking for the future. You, we, we, we will see what kind of product, not only in household and hygienic, also maybe is uh, innovative food industry will be important, or other industry which will really need our country to, 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 to the future customer. This is the main, main approach, and uh, what, I, what, is my, what is my dream? what is we expect what we hope then the and the, the CEO of a country with the a lot of innovative uh industries uh like in turkey because uh, in turkey is very innovative country with a lot of leading companies in many sectors and uh, i think the joint ventures with ukrainian company will be the, the unique chance to grow together and to develop the new ukraine this is my this is my dream what i see and what what i invite for the future together Many thanks for your thoughts. Um, earlier during this forum, we discussed uh, we discussed that um, agriculture processing is the future, and we, it will uh, give a lot of benefits to those who will do it. But our next panelist already is in this business for many years, uh, Mr. Boris Shostopalov, or should I call you Doctor uh, Shostopalov, because our next panelist has PhD in in economics. He is also a vice president of uh, Association of Bakers of Ukraine, um, a member of board of Flower Mills of Ukraine, and he makes, well, his company makes, maybe he also makes, but uh, no one knows about that, but he makes very delicious cakes and cheesecakes. So if you ever come to Ukraine and stop by a gas station, ask uh, a lady in the counter for a cheesecake, and you know that this is the cheesecake that Boris companies is producing. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much for these presentations. Um, um, now our company <laughs> looks a little bit different than before 24 February. Because uh, after the 24 of February, our peaceful company uh, one day um, start to work like a part of critical infrastructure in, in Ukraine because uh, our factory produce uh, bread, uh, flour, um, different type of uh, flakes, uh, crops, and uh, now we produce uh, more easy products than before the war. And of course, we continue to produce a ready meal and frozen cheesecake, what is lovely our clients in petrol stations in Ukraine. But now we must produce more easy products. We reduce our uh, portfolio, our product portfolio, because now uh, many of our clients, it's a not a chain of shops or modern trade. It's uh, civil uh, administration, civil war administrations, it's army, uh, international humanitarian uh, organizations like United Nations, old uh, World Food Program. And uh, now we're responsible about uh, a lot of people for delivery with very easy, very easy products. Before the uh, war, we have uh, different 15 
enterprises in everywhere in Ukraine from east to the west. Uh, during the start of, after the start of war, we lost three hour factory in uh, south east of Ukraine in the city of Berdyansk, uh, Kherson and uh, Melitopol. And uh, one of our factory completely destroyed in city of Orekhov because it's completely uh, line of the battle and uh, after the 11, 11 arrived of rockets uh, our factory is destroyed completely and uh, now we relocations part of our equipment relocations part of our business and continue to work of course we continue to work we uh, continue to develop part of our business of course we must to decrease our uh, plans uh, for the strategical development and uh, now we more think about uh, plans for the one month not for the one year or more uh, but we start to we uh, come back to the export market because uh, part of our products usually we uh, sell in uh, Europe in the uh, Middle East, it's first of all, it's uh, confectionery products, it's different type of uh, syrups, toppings, and uh, ready meal, frozen first of all. And uh, now we continue to export, but of course we uh, feel all the problem with the uh, stock in the logistics corridor, and price of the logistics, it's uh, uh, another new experience for us and uh, we must to stay more efficiently than before we must to think about uh, opex uh, every day because now uh, turnover and uh, and money it's like a bloody in the system of our company but uh, like i said before we still life we continue to work we start to develop our project what we frozen uh, with this with the war and uh, we hope when they return of course our city and our factory we rebuilt our factory and uh, more concentrate to uh, new products uh, because uh, like i talked in our presentations before now we concentrate uh, for the new type of business like agri-food tech business with uh, more knowledge more r d in the product and uh, i think like uh, andrew talked before uh, we very good uh, platform Ukrainian business, very good platform for the start, new business, new generation of business, and uh, very good uh, time for start uh, build new type of cooperations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Boris. Uh, our next panelist is Yuri Krivoshaya, who is uh, a managing partner at a company called uh, Toronto Kyiv. They are owning a lot of real estate, including offices, retail spaces, and restaurants uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but also, he is um, a co-owner or partner of uh, the largest e-commerce company in Ukraine called Yakabu. Um, Yuri, can you share your experience, how you managed to, uh, with some internal crisis in your companies and overall and uh, do you build any new types of cooperation in with ukrainian companies or with foreign companies what are some of your advices thank you um first of all i'd like to thank uh, for everybody else to be here because today is incredibly important you know for for us to get any type of support and collaboration and galina also thank you because i think all of us are honored here to have such a moderator uh, because it's all about teamwork uh, coming back to you know personal cases uh, every company uh, had a little bit different case in terms of the crisis that started with a full-scale invasion starting from the 24th of uh, February uh, in a real estate business um, uh, basically uh, taking consideration that all responsible business is playing a significant role today in helping to defend our country in all ways possible some of which already 
already been stated, but maybe even uh, deeper. Uh, some of the premises were not, let's put it this way, for commercial use. They've been used for uh, what's needed for defense purposes. Uh, and uh, the only tenants, for instance, that were working in the beginning, they were uh, supplying uh, food to the army, territorial defense, and for humanitarian needs. So therefore, that means that you have zero revenues, not zero income, you have zero revenues. And from another uh, side of the balance sheet, all obligations, responsibilities, financial responsibilities remain the same. So basically, you have to find the ways how to do balance in this situation, and you have to make priorities when, for instance, you have, figuratively speaking, you know, one thousand dollars to pay, and you have ten dollars to do that. But you make choices, and some of the choices I think have been voiced today already. You focus on people because uh, support of the team. Uh, um, some, some members of which actually lost everything they had because of the Russian attacks, you focus on helping people. And actually jump forward uh, to today, we've been able gradually, slowly to rejuvenate you know, a lot of premises. We relaunched a lot of things. Some of the tenants came back. The hotel started to work again. Uh, so step by step, and, and, and the team really appreciates because some of the members of the team had concrete offers to stay outside of the country in a safe environment with a good salaries, but they made uh, objective or subjective whatever choice to come back. So this type of bonds, this type of positive energy, that sets fundamentals for long growth. In terms of e-commerce company that was mentioned, we have been the largest um, uh, market leader actually in Ukraine in our uh, segment uh, with a vertically integrated business and transforming to omnichannel uh, platform uh, and you know having you know a lot of employees and having more than three million uh, customers and of course when things became uh, pretty severe starting from February 24th you have again zero revenues but you make choices what do you do in addition to supporting the team uh, we for example have our own application which allows access to electronic content books to to the clients so we opened that up for free and starting from the 24th of February until like let's say June we had actually exponential growth in users up to 600,000 users we had uh, a lot of uh, thank yous from uh, from the army from refugees from everybody because it was a chance for them to uh, switch their mind to uh, help not only in terms of mental health but to continue to get a uh, piece of culture piece of literature in in, in their language in Ukraine language and 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 to keep on going every day and as of today uh, as our policy every problem we treat as a challenge which has to be solved we actually started to develop further we now launched international expansion it's at early stage but we did that and um, our goal is to continue to build on those lessons learned on the positive feedback and see what strategies we can build in order to reach even you know greater success of course uh, support and everything is needed because again everything is a matter of teamwork but I think the good fundamentals are being set there another thing since uh, all of us involved in a lot of different directions uh, not only humanitarian but other means um, you know the, the war speeds things up and, and really shows who is who and uh, I think it has been you know very clear that business all of us have showed how efficiently it's possible to unite very quickly and to produce concrete solutions to concrete tasks that are even needed for the army or needed for humanitarian purposes quicker than other counterparties can do that and um, we will continue to do this and we will not wait but of course the more support uh, we can get the more benefits every single stakeholder will will receive and uh, according to that i would like to say that uh why it is a good time to invest right now in ukraine it's not 
only because there is a potential for first mover advantage again because new market rules have been formed right now because all the business is united and becoming a true subject. It, it's also, if you try to look at the whole situation, uh, not only from a local perspective, but from a global perspective. So I would like to state a, a like few thesis that uh, to invest into Ukraine is actually very profitable and can be very beneficial for everybody. Uh, why? Because of several reasons. One reason is, let's say, global macroeconomics. Again, the World Bank decreased uh, in June uh, the growth of GDP from 4.1% uh, to 2.9% uh, because of many factors. But inflationary you know, pressures or energy prices or you know, uh, threat of hunger among the reasons. But I must tell you that uh, in, in economy, uh, not all the effects of the war kicked in yet. So if the changes are not being made, we might see even worsening of the global GDP growth. So the sooner you know, we can stop altogether you know, uh, this Russian aggression, the most successful everybody will be going forward. Because if you look at every cent central banking regulatory, uh, you look at the f federal fund uh, rates, what's happening, you look at Bank of England, what they're doing, you look at EU, which is coming you know, back from negative rates. And the federal fund rate has the largest spike in, in many, many years. And there is uh, an, an additional spike is planned for, for the next year. So that means that, uh, and, and some of the greatest inflationary pressures are energy resources, again, and uh, uh, food security. And again, Russian war causes that. So the sooner we can solve that, everybody will benefit from that. It's mathematically, it's not only emotionally. And uh, why it's also profitable, because I think you hear from different angles, but basically the same statement that uh, right now it, there are true fundamentals, principles and values on which you know proper collaborations can be formed. Uh, and uh, taking consideration that, uh, I'm sorry for subjective statement, but Ukrainian business showed tremendous resilience during turbulent times. Can you imagine uh, what success from joint ventures can be obtained when uh, you do this development during good times. I mean, I think the upsides can be tremendous. And the en entry ticket right now is relatively small. So you can reach much more IRR or future market capitalization if you enter right now and and you will require much less resources so i i strongly believe that right now is uh, actually a very good time of course you have to select good partners as any uh, in any other market but i think uh you have all the instruments all the means to do this as of today so today is definitely a good time uh to do this and as it was also stated ukraine is like a startup and it's true because if you look at any segment of the economy it's all open field to act. So all the ingredients to move forward are right here. And, and we are from our side definitely ready to, you know, make a good success together. Thanks. Thank you. And I want to give a floor to uh, our next speaker, who is Vladimir Reshetov. Uh, his company is the biggest seller of medical equipment in Ukraine. They basically work through their offline dealers, but also online, and uh, have about uh, 2 million uh, buyers on an annual basis, which is a number. Uh, they also have a medical clinics in Chernivtsi, which is basically the western part of the country. So, Vladimir, I want you... Uh, I want to ask you also to share your experience. How is it to do business in medical sphere now? How is your business operating in Chernivtsi? Can you suggest to invest in Chernivtsi in medical sphere or any other uh, kind of sphere? Because um, there were a lot of talks that you know my, maybe it's a little bit risky to come to Ukraine now. How is Western Ukraine going on? Thank you for presentation. Uh, I will correct you. We have a marketplace. It is international marketplace. Uh, it is uh, the trading platform for medical equipment, and uh, we help our two million 
uh, cells and bios all over the world. So we are located in Ukraine, but we're doing business also globally. Also, we have a medical center in Chernobyl, like Alina said, and uh, offline business of medical equipment. And the war changes the rules. The war changes uh, our focus. The war changes our plans. So we learned how to close projects, close projects very fast. Uh, we learned how to close even profitable projects because uh, we don't service Russian uh, clients. So we, we have a big audience uh, of Russian visitors in our marketplace. And uh, also we learned how to relocate families from the war zone to Chernivtsi. Uh, it's a city near Romania. And also mm, the market size uh, in medical equipment in Ukraine uh, was decreased in three times, but uh, it is not only mm, market size. Mm, so you mm, could uh, imagine that uh, some people from other regions um, come to western part of Ukraine, so the market size uh, increased in 20%. Um, also, if you are in ID sector, I would recommend to use our special region uh, for ID sector. Uh, it's uh, zero um, income tax and 6.5% um, salary tax. Uh, and uh, whatever the circumstances, uh, I'm sure that we will win this war because Ukraine is about uh, free people. Uh, Ukraine is about freedom. Freedom is in our culture, in it's like our religion. Freedom allows us to produce wonderful, profitable projects. Thank you for your attention. And glory to Ukraine. Uh, Vadim Gurjus uh, is our next speaker. Uh, they are working in the sphere of manufacturing foil eco packaging for food. Also, one of the biggest uh, production in this sphere. Um, Vadim, can you also share your experience? Um, how war affected you? How did you deal with crisis management? What are lessons learned? And what are your advices for investors who are thinking whether they should come to Ukraine or not? Um, I will tell you that I'm listening carefully all of, of my colleagues and partners to whom I know some of them more than 20 years. And I'll tell you that last 30 years we are continuously in crisis management. And uh, what I see the, here that all of us, we are very stress resistant, not only resistant, not only smart. Because uh, as I repeat again, within the last 30 years, uh, it was, it was many crises, minimum four economical crises, two revolutions, war from the 2014, and now it's one of the biggest invasion and war after the World Second. And we are still surviving and even doing the business and profit. I tell you the short stories about this company, which is uh, representative today, Studio Park in Ukraine. Uh, when the, after the 24th of February, we are immediately united in company. Thanks to Sergei, we were coordinated from the CEO club. We were in contact with all of our colleagues and we started to help territorial defense and army. 
honestly, for the first 10 days, two weeks, our government side was completely involved in different things, not to, to support this part of the defense as a food, as delivering uh, supply, etc. Thanks to that, for the first two weeks, we move and uh, company, our, for example, our company, they never closed the door and even uh, we located between uh, that place which is everybody right now knows, Bucha, European and uh, Kyiv. Combat zone was very close to us. We were forced to evacuate it from Kyiv. We gave for millions uh, support uh, this packaging to the volunteers and army. Then we were in the western part of the Ukraine. After that situation was stabilized, we immediately came back and started to produce our production, our uh, product uh, in uh, near Kyiv. And I will tell you honestly, still. Uh, successful and profitable even today and thanks first of all to our colleagues and partners from Turkey who supported us very seriously. He is the one holding, very famous holding is Kibar, sends them and the company Asan Aluminium which is uh, inside of this uh, Kibar holding, they really help us and support it till today. And the, it's a short story of the company and uh, I don't want to repeat what my colleagues told that how we survive and how we live, how we do the business. And my main message that Ukrainian uh, partner and Ukrainian companies is very reliable. Uh, we are very stress resistant and uh, we have a plans. For example, with Andrea right now, we are talking about the, some project abroad in European Union. We are thinking and we do the project to expand in Ukraine. And if somebody interesting to the real to invest to the real sector of the economic, we are very open. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Um, in uh, his book, uh, Anti-Fragility, Nassim Taleb said that those who can actually go through the crisis will always uh, become stronger and uh, become more flexible and more uh, creative. And they will definitely win the competition of the future. And I'm more than sure that uh, these gentlemen who uh, were speaking to you, who were sharing their experience, are uh, champions in anti-crisis management. And they are the examples of this anti-fragility. So if you are searching for partners in Ukraine, they are the ones. My recommendations. Uh, but really, as uh, Andris Desenko in the beginning of our panel said, if you're thinking about some business with Ukraine, if you're thinking about staying or coming with some new projects, this is exactly the time when you should start doing your research, when you should start looking for some sectors that might be interested, interesting, uh, when you should be starting uh, looking for some partners, including local partners, and also uh, looking for some, uh, for some money. In this uh, behalf, I just wanted to add a little bit on behalf of Ukrainian government that we are also working hard to create some additional opportunities for investors, both internal investors but also external investors. We are holding negotiations with two uh, huge American organizations who are providing um, investment insurance called uh, MIGA and DFC, Development Financial Corporation, uh, about military investment insurance. So basically, they will provide an insurance for force majeure, which um, um, abolish any kind of risk and which uh, gives you an opportunity just to calculate the mathematics and see if Ukraine is interesting for you because other risks they will take. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there are great opportunities uh, to come to Ukraine and work in industrial parks. Uh, Ukrainian parliament just 
passed the legislation on that a couple of weeks ago. And now, basically, industrial parks do have a lot of privileges in terms of taxation privileges, in terms of um, some other uh, custom duties privileges, and stuff like that. But in my opinion, the most uh, interesting thing will come when economic recovery, but also reconstruction of Ukraine will start. And those who are interested in that should already start doing research, finding contacts in government, finding contacts in the private sector, because the reconstruction is already uh, starting taking place. And in this regard, private-public partnership will be a very interesting and probably one of the key key tools. We know that Turkey experience, have great experience in PPP, building airports, building healthcare facilities and stuff like that. And we want to bring this experience to Ukraine. But we can also bring some Turkish partners to Ukraine. So think about it. Think about Ukraine as an opportunity. Think about Ukraine as a place to invest, to invest your money, but also your emotions and your time. Because this will be the best place to invest shortly. That's what we all hope for. Thank you for, the, for your attention and thanks to all my panelists for sharing their thoughts and opinions. Thanks. And thank you very much, Honorable Alina Yanchenko, for sharing most of the stage today with us. And uh, thank you, distinguished speakers. So we are coming towards the end of the day today. Um, we have another panel coming up. It's about digital business platform in Ukraine. And this will be our last panel of the day. And then afterwards, I want to remind everyone, uh, our speakers, sponsors, diplomatic and diplomatic people and ministers for the dinner cruise on the Bosphorus, which will be at 7.30 p.m. So next coming up will be Acting Director of the State Institution, Entrepreneurship and Expert Promotion Office, Andriy Remizov. This presentation will cover the Ukraine DIIA business platform, which is a national online platform for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship support centers all over the country. Is Mr. Andrew Remizov here? Uh, ah, hello, sorry, online. Hello. So I leave you the stage, you're already on the stage. Uh, yes, so uh, today I would like to present the national uh, platform for SME and uh, export development uh, in Ukraine. Uh, it's called uh, DA Business uh, and
Thank you very much. And so we are arriving to the end of the day today. And thank you very much for all your attention. And tomorrow we will be back here. Uh, just for the remainder spectators, I want to remind uh, that there will be a dinner cruise on the Bosphorus for speakers, sponsors, ministers, diplomatics, and for our platinum guests. So good evening and hope to see you all here tomorrow. Bye bye. Oh, sorry, sorry. Since we're here, yes. Yes. Yep. Hi, my name is Anton Kononov. I'm Ukrainian, uh, living in Poland from seven years. I would like to help you if you need it. Uh, you can. I think the connection is cut oh. because there was not a question uh, answer my... session. Okay, for so scene. please give me contact, his contact. And I will yeah, speak yeah, with yeah, our yeah, and uh, I'll, uh, I would like to help to, to develop this, uh, this application. We will speak yeah, off yeah. stage because okay. there was not an. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.